This week's episode is sponsored by Change. Change is the number one mentoring program that teaches you e-commerce from scratch. Change has a real community with real results. I have been working with Ryan for many years now and have attended many of his events and retreats across the world and got to meet members and the amazing community of like-minded people. Ryan works with a lot of big names in the business world, helping them build online businesses and e-commerce. Change offers personal one-on-one support, no experience needed, but like anything, this takes time and is not a get-rich-quick scheme. If you put the work in, you will get the results. E-commerce and online shopping is getting bigger and bigger. This is a great opportunity for anyone that is looking for financial freedom. For more information, go follow Ryan on Instagram at RyanJB and he will guide you through the steps to help you get started and build a successful online business. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you are notified for when my next podcast goes live. And boom, we're on. Yeah. And today's guest, we've got Brian Rolf. Is it okay to call you Brian Rolf? Because I know yes, you, yeah. you've changed your name. Yeah. Um, but we'll plug your book straight away, Brian. The Lost Essex Boy. You were the brother to Craig. I was, yeah. And up to 26 years to the lad had his life taken away. Yeah, if nearly 30 years later, we're still talking about it. It's um, such a high profile case with the Essex Boys killings. I've seen you on my good friend Liam Tuff's podcast. Great podcast. You came clean with a couple of things which must have been tough. You came clean about being an informant, about being abused as a kid, about your relationship with your brother, like some dark, dark stuff. A great interview, so anybody check it out on Liam's channel. Great friend of mine, does great interviews also. First and foremost, how are you? Not too bad, thank you. Nice journey down. Yeah, it's a nice day as well. <laughs> it is a nice day. We had a rain we left this morning, didn't we? So, yeah, it was a nice day, yeah. Brilliant. First and foremost, thanks for coming on the show. Where can people buy your book, Brian? Uh, Amazon. Amazon? Yeah. Check it out. And uh, yeah, listen, we'll get right into it. Obviously, you've seen some of the interviews, you know my style of interviewing. We'll always go back to the start of my guests, get my, a, more of a bit of an understanding about you, Brian, where you grew up and how it all began. I grew up in uh, Basildon. Well, that's where we live. We moved to Basildon from London when we was young. We live at Linford Drive. We had a, a brilliant life, me and my sister. We had a like, normal people, mum, dad. I never wanted for anything. And then in 68, it all changed. Mother decided to have an affair for three years. Uh, I was laying in bed one night. Uh, I could hear someone outside the bedroom door. I got up, went to the door, and there was a bloke standing. I can't say it was me dad or it was John Kennedy. And they just said to me, get back in bed, little boy. And I went back in bed. I was only six. And then the next day, my father was killed. John Kennedy come through the uh, window. Mum let him in. And he done him a bowling skill across the head. And then they... Uh, Lift him downstairs, put him in his work vehicle and dumped him on the 127 uh, motorway to make it look like a robbery. But took £500 out of his pocket. And in those days, 500 quid's a lot of money. So my dad had a market stall. We had a lovely house, uh, brilliant neighbours. And then mum got sent to prison. So I went to care. I went to live in uh, Cambridge with uh, Sandy and Elfie. Um, sister. I can't remember when my sister went, to be honest with you. She was a more common, sensible kid. She, her head, she was older than what she was supposed to be, sort of thing. I uh, was there f- for just over a year. And then I come back to Essex with mum. And we lived at, uh, got a house at 117 Long Riding, which was a three-storey house. So you had, your ground floor was the kitchen and toilet. The next floor was the front room, Sharon's bedroom. Then the top floor was mum's bedroom and mine and Craig's bedroom. Well, Craig was just born, so he's still a baby then, yeah. So that was our floor. Uh, how can you... Mum's changed. She All she wanted to know was having affairs, spending the money. So we struggled uh, big time for food, for money. Michael, me 
next brother down went to live with Nan and Grandad. For what reason, I don't know. But he was taken away and lived with Nan and Grandad, but lived up the road. So Sharon looked after us. Mum was always out spending the money. Uh, some mornings, Mum would get up and she had no milk, so I'd, we had told us to go down the street and pinch the milk. So we used to pinch milk on people's doorsteps. But the people knew what we were doing. You know, because They actually knew what was going on. So Mum had all these affairs. Uh, Sharon had a friend's. I looked after Craig, so I used to take Craig down long riding shops, begging outside the bookies of a guy who mask masks on, outside the chip shop, asking for chip bits. And at night time, when mummy's bring blokes home, uh, I used to go in the bedroom and steal money off the bloke. And I'm not going to lie, I used to go in there and just just pennies in those days, you with me, to, to, to survive for food. And then one day, one night, the bloke woke up and caught me going through his pockets chased me into our bedroom so I jumped out on the window ledge holding the window ledge thinking he couldn't get me and they whacked me hands with a belt and I fell three stories down into a wheelbarrow and now I'm in hospital uh, social service come out uh, mum explained said that I jumped from the window because I was a, a normal kid and then I was sent off to uh, boarding school the age of 10 to just over 16 See, your brother Craig, he was born in prison, is that correct? Craig was born in Holloway, yeah, yeah. Who was the father to Craig? John Kennedy. The w person your mum was having an affair yeah, with? Yeah, I I didn't know this, but at the minute John Kennedy is speaking to me on my YouTube channel. No. Yeah. The guy who had an affair with your yeah, mum, how yeah. was that feeling for you? Uh, I'm not bothered now. You with me? Years ago, when I found out about him, I got older... The guy who killed your dad? Yeah, well, when I got older, about 16, 17, I was on a probation officer and I wanted to go and see him in prison to ask him why, to, to try and put things, take this big demon out the back of my head because I had so much pain inside me, uh, but I wasn't allowed to go. So, yeah, what he says is John Kenny and he's come out, he's told me things that only he would know. And this is the guy who had an affair with your mum and killed your father? Yeah, he had an affair with my mum for three years, yeah. A young mechanic. And why did they say he killed your dad? He won't tell me. He won't tell me that. He just tells me that uh, Craig is ease. He regrets what he's done. He wish he could turn back the clock. Uh, he lied from my mother over the murders, but he'd done it through love. She wrote to him for the first, I think, something like six months and stopped writing to me, just ignored him. So I, I don't know whether it's guilt, he's, he, he's speaking to me. Uh, I'm interested, but I haven't pushed him at the minute. Can you understand what I'm trying to say? I don't want to push him in and start showing anger at him why you took me, Dad. I just want to get to know him a bit better and the reasons why. I believe my mother put him up to it. Was your mum very manipulative? My mum was a very evil person, very evil. I remember once me and Sharon come out of school before my dad died and uh, mum went to a friend's house but we weren't allowed in the house, so we had to stand outside an oak tree while it pissed down with rain until she came out of that house. Yeah, she was she was jealous of me and Sharon because we were all dead. Was she a prostitute or anything? No, I wouldn't say she's a prostitute, but she liked men. She was a... she. All she thought about was what she could get between her legs. It sounds horrible, but it's the truth. And we suffered through that. What was your mum's sentence for the murder of your father? She got 18 months for harbouring lying to the, to the, to the judge. And she went to prison while you were pregnant? She went to Holloway, and she, where she had Craig in Holloway Prison. Do you think that could have been one of the reasons why your dad was killed, because she was pregnant with another man? It could be. I remember once uh, there was a fight on the front door before my dad died, between John Kennedy and my dad. Then I remember we, my dad took me in the van to Basildon Town Centre Market, and there was a fight on the market store between John Kennedy and my dad. So my mum won't tell us the truth. She all, all she keeps saying is, my dad used to beat her up and she ran away with all of us and that lot. But when I ask neighbours that are still around that, that, that send me messages, my dad never touched her. You with me? But I lost everything because of her. I lost my grandparents. I lost my dad. I lost my family. What age did you go to boarding school? I went when I was 10. So social service come and got me uh, in a car, nice lady. I come out the out of the house with a, a carrier bag. It's all I could add for me clothes, a carrier bag. So I went to Victoria train, uh, Coach Station, uh, met the, some of the kids there in the school, and then travelled off to Dorchester, and that was it. And never come back for 
16 years because mum didn't want me back. So every every half term come, I would either stay at other kids' houses or I would stay in the school because no one actually wanted me back home. So when I got to boarding school, I uh, went into a hall. Uh, we allocated our dormitories and was introduced to the older boys who we wore. I was put into dorm one with another two lads. Uh, first night was in there with sleep and the prefects come in and started eating us with slippers and that. It's, it's a thing they do apparently, but we were little kids, we were crying our eyes out and that. So the next day we got moved up to dormitory five, which is three beds in. Every dormitory had a, a window and had like a, a dormant roof, so you can go and sit on the roof at night time. So every morning the headmaster come round and they'd put the covers up and they'd smack your ass and grab your testicles. Well, I didn't understand that, why, why he did that, but he did it to us free. And then about a month later, uh, I got prefect come and got me. I had to go to his flat because he had a flat inside in the complex. It's Thomas Hardy's old house. So at the bottom of the top end of the house, he had his own personal flat, which he stayed a few nights. And then Taft, the deputy, would stay a few nights. He come and got me, uh, sat me in his chair, locked the door, took his dressing gun off and his pajamas on. And he said, do you want uh, a drink, Brian? Well, I'm only 10 and a half. So I said, no, thank you. No, thank you. He said, no, have a drink. So he gave me a coat, but in the coat was whiskey or vodka, one of the two. I started sipping it and I felt right dizzy. The next minute he dimmed the light out, stood there, took his pajamas off, he said, get, in, get into bed. And that's when he first sexually abused me. And I, I screamed and cried. And after it happened, I was back to me, back to my room. I, I cried all night. I even wet the bed. I used to wet the bed quite often because we were scared that he might come and get us the next night or the next night. But he got. I'd say twice a month we were being abused by him. And people knew in the school, but they didn't care. Because if they said anything, they'd lose their privileges. So prefects kept their mouth shut. Whether they went through it in, in, in their younger days, I don't know. But yeah, I was abused for six years. So when I was about 12, 13, I couldn't take no more. And I run, to, run from the school in pyjamas to Dorchester Police Station. Uh, went to the police station, see the, see the officer there. He took me into a room. I was crying my eyes out. She's a, a lady police officer. There, so someone would come and see you. I must have been there about two hours. And then next minute, the officer walked in with George Frederick Rigger. And they called me a liar. I took me back to school and gave me a good idea. So I lived with being sexually abused for 16 years. How was that? No one believing you? He was, it was at Dorchester's a small village. And he was like highly, highly regarded and that lot. So... Because the boarding school was for troubled kids, who's going to believe us? You know what I mean? We're just troubled kids that no one wanted. So yeah, That's a sad reality. And I always mention this when it was Barbara O'Hare. She released a book called The Hospital, uh, Aston Hall. It was evil doctors who were experimenting on the kids, killing the kids, abusing the kids, raping the kids. The thing with these, they had a checklist of having these kids who would be suitable for this place, kids who come from the broken home, the parents didn't want them, maybe they were had addiction issues, they were just naughty kids, they would sign them off at Aston Hall, so what happens is they were signed off as crazy, so when the kids actually run away to tell the police or find help about the stuff that's happening in these hospitals, because their records say they're crazy, they take the kids straight back into basically hell, so they had the checklist of everything that they did in place for the kids so no one would believe them. That's what happened to us. I mean, it was in a closed-in school. You had fields, you had sport. I mean, I was fantastic across country. I had trials for, for Weymouth. I played with Dorset cricket team. I was fantastic at sport. I wasn't a violent person. I didn't like violence. I still don't like violence. I was just a quiet kid, but I didn't learn to uh, read and spell till I was about 17 because there was no interest in teaching you. It was just a quick in there a quick income for the headmaster. So it was all cancels that put all the kids in there. And if you, like you, you did, you complained about being abused, no one believed you, or you got a good eye on the cane. So you, you put up with it. You had to, you, you just presumed it was a way of life. So one, one term, it was, uh, I think it was Easter term, all the kids went home and, and none of the kids' parents, wouldn't say didn't want me, had no room for me at that, that period of time. So George said I had to go and stay with a, a couple in Weymouth. So they come and got me, a nice couple, picked me up, took me to Weymouth, brought me ice cream, took me wimpy bar, treated me. That was it, lovely. Showed me my room, nicest pie with them. Got in bed that night. 
must have been about one, one of the night, they come and got me, abused by two adults. I didn't even know. And that went on for, I think, three weeks. But it's, it's hard to explain. People say you can do, you can't do anything. Once it gets in, into that head of yours, you think you're the person in the wrong. You think it's right that you should do this. And no one's going to believe, so what's the point of trying to say anything? Yeah, you freeze. I've interviewed enough men who's, it's took 20, 30, 40 years to eventually open up to went on because a lot of people blame themselves. Some of the men were concerned because they were getting turned on by it. But again, it's just the, the mindset just takes you to whole different places. That's paedophilia. No one's in control at that age. No one understands what's going on at that age. You're being manipulated by sick, sick individuals. Was this a man and a woman? It was a... The, the people that took me to stay with me was a man and a woman. They was in their 40s. But George Frederick Riga, he was married to an African lady. She she knew about it, but she never really got involved in it. So so do you think it was some sort of paedophile ring where they're all passing kids on to each other? I do, yeah. Yeah, I think we were... We were weak kids that no one wanted us. So it was advantage. They took advantage of us with me. It's hard. It's hard to explain. It's you mean people may think, "Well, you're dirty. You should have done this. You should have that." Put yourself in my shoes in those days. You had no way out. If you go to a police station and they don't believe you, who's going to believe you? No one. So you've got to accept what goes on in life, and you think it's normal end of the day and what frightened me in life when I got older was the fact of me having kids that's what for all honesty they don't know this but frightened me because would I have been the same if I had kids would I have been like him would I at that inside me think well I'm going to go and touch my kid it's, it's natural so I didn't have kids till I was late 30s and I've never ever armed my kids never laid a finger on but to this day in the back of my head it's still there. I can't get rid of it. it the fact that I was being abused twice a week and no one believed me. And now they're coming out and people believe me. You know, the, the police come and see me a few years ago. They tried their best to, to get it sorted, but he's dead now. But it's there in the back of my head and I'll never, ever get rid of that. Yeah, that's the kid. heartbreaking thing. That's it's trauma that you never wish upon anyone in Fair play for being so open and honest. It takes massive courage, but it's sad to see what kids actually have to go through. And like you say, the target, the the ones who they know there's not going to be any backlash, where they can fly under the radar, the naughty kids, the ones who are signed off as crazy, the ones the parents doesn't really care about them. Did you ever reach out to your mum when this was going on? No, I never see my mum. Well, I tell a lie, mum comes to sports day once in six years of boarding school, only because the headmaster paid for her. Uh, she came to sports day we had it in Weymouth and uh, she was more interested in talking to the men than watching me so she went back on the coat I'll never see her again and when did you get out what age I left boarding school uh, just over 16 all the lads in boarding school most of them joined the army and Royal Navy I wanted to join the Merchant Navy I wanted to go on cruise ships see the world so I went to South End and I passed my test even though I was quite thick, I passed my test and I was going to be sent to Gravesend for training. So I left school. I went home to Basildon to, to tell me mum, thinking she'd be proud of me. Uh, I went home to Beanbridge, where she lived at 158. Knocked on the door, there was no answer. So a lady next door come out and I said, I'm looking for my mum, please. So she asked her, I said, my name's Brian. She said, oh, Brian, she's around Rita's house, around the corner, because it's all bungalows on this estate. So I said, oh, thank you, I'll go around there. So I went round to Rita, I knocked on the door. Uh, Rita's daughter comes to the door and I said, is my mum there, please? She said, wait a minute, I'll go and, I'll go and get her for you. So I told her I was. She shut the door. Then Rita comes to the door and she said, Brian, look, I'm sorry, your mum don't want to know you. And that was it, that just killed me. So I left, I broke into a camper van, slept the night and I made my way back to Dorchester. I got uh, picked up by the police, not arrested for family on the, on the motorway. It took me to the next uh, junction. I said, you can't find a motorway. So in the end, it, just over a day, it took me to get to Dorchester. I went in the school uh, in the afternoon. I went to the headmaster's room and I blamed him for everything. I told him. Uh, it comes to an argument. I was a bit more brave, I suppose. I think it was the anger inside me that made me braver because I'm not a fighter. And I picked up, uh, it's like a, a metal knife and you open letters with. And I stabbed him in the arm and I run off like a coward. 
and I took two records with me I stole and I think I stole some, something else I can't remember and I run to Dorchester and I got arrested uh, I was taken to the police station I was charged with the offences because uh, I had no fixed abode I was put into a hostel at uh, Weymouth so I had to sign the police station every day so I was in Weymouth for about, I think it was about eight months, nine months, until it went to magistrate's court for the final time after reports, and I got sentenced to Borstal for nine months. What was that like for you? <laughs> it's funny. I went into Borstal. Because I was into boarding school, I didn't think no one could hurt me anymore. So I wasn't frightened. The fact is, the shouting and screaming when they shaved your head off and put you in a, a room, then you go into a dormitory, and you've got all these big lads there that, you know, you think, oh, what are they in for? But no, I made friends with everyone. So I didn't find Borstal very hard. All the marching about and the cleaning and scrubbing, yeah, but I didn't find the Borstal hard. I was in Hardy House, we played football for them. So I made friends with a lot of lads. Were you ever nervous that you could have been abused in there again? It never crossed my mind, to be honest with you. Do you because, think you were ready for anything? Yeah, because it, it was already in my system. I wasn't bothered what was happening to me. Did you become numb to it? Yeah, if, if if it meant meant me having an easy life in prison, I had to do that again. I'd have done it because not because of the easy life. It's because it's in your brain, and you think what they do to you is right. What about the relationship with Craig? How because he must have been young when you left. When I left Craig, we, we were close as anything. I mean, he was four year, uh, six years younger than me, so we were right close. When I left, I didn't see him. He went to boarding school. He did himself. I think he was there a year and he, he stabbed a kid with, a, I think it was a compass or a fault, he stabbed him in the leg. So he got chucked out of boarding school in Clacton where he was. He went to normal school, uh, had a good education, got a, an apprenticeship as a tyre fitter. So when I come out of uh, ball stall, I had a probation officer. She got me a flat and everything. Uh, I had no contact with mother at all. But I met Craig out one night and now I got back to know Craig again. And he was a tyre fitter. And I had a job working for an Irish company, uh, shop blasting bridges, tunnelling, shafting that lot. So I had a job. And uh, I was with Craig all the time. You know, we had me back. But mother never knew if she found out that me and Craig were, were, were sort of back together again, friends, brothers. It, 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 yeah, it's hard to put. My ambition was to destroy a lot of them for what they put me through was to destroy my mother put her in a grave if I could do it it sounds cruel but that's what that's what was inside me destroy Craig destroy Michael destroy I wanted to destroy the lot because none of them were there when I needed them so that was my ambition was to get back in, in with Craig and Michael and destroy him and that's what I did why did she, your mum disown you because I looked like my dad too much and she blamed me for that that's her excuse. So when I, when I I'm a probation officer, uh, she said I found your grandparents, your dad's uh, mum and dad. So I said, can I meet him? So I went to Wimbledon to meet my grandparents. They met me at the train station, took me to the house. His brothers turned up. His, one of his brothers a pilot, and one's something else. Like right, right, nice family, posh people, nice respect. He took me in the house at Sunday dinner all the kisses and cuddles in the world you wanted, you know, made me welcome. I was so, so happy. And then granddad took me to the train station and he, his words were to me, we don't think you should come back. We don't want to see you no more because you minus your dad too much and it's, it's too hard for your nan. So I never see them. So every time I thought I was getting up the ladder, I was being pushed back down again. So the anger inside me got worse and worse. Yeah, because you're, you're blackballed basically to not have a family. How was it going through everything you've went through to then everyone you expect to love you, support you, turn their back on you? Is that where the anger comes from? It's not a, people who abused you or hurt you. It's from your family who... Do you blame your family for everything you went through? I blame my mother, brothers and sisters for everything I went through. Why Craig, if he was younger? Because he wasn't there for me. No matter what age, he was not there for me. So I thought, if I destroy Craig, I'm destroying my mother. Craig was the favourite. Craig was John Kennedy's son. Were you jealous of Craig? No, I wasn't jealous of him. I never had any friends at, at school. When we used, to, when my mum come out of prison, 
she sent us back to the same school that all the kids knew that we had, our father was killed. So we we were uh, picked on. Well, Sharon won't because she had a friend I was. Most of the kids at school used to wear long trousers because I made holes in my trousers most of the time. I had to wear shorts at the time. I stunk. No kid wanted to be near me. I had two brothers that used to beat me up every day in the play, playground. That's that, That's what I went through. I went through hell because she had an affair with someone. When did Craig, who, did Craig know who his dad was or was he think your dad was his dad? Craig, this is true, Craig and Michael didn't know their dad was killed and two people started talking. For years and years and years, they believed their dad died of an illness. That's what they were told. And then it's all come out. And then I know, I think mother told Craig the truth that, you know, a, a, a dad, his dad was killed, but she didn't say she was part of it. But as far as I know, they all, that Michael and Craig knew that he, he just died of an illness. It's all these people coming out and say, well, Craig had a chip on his shoulder because he found out his dad was dead. That, that's a load of rubbish. It's, a, it's just a story after story people keep making up. Craig was a lovely lad, a right good lad. Apprentice car, a tyre fitter for Basden Tyres. Loved fishing. You with me? And I was jealous of that, I suppose, because he went home every night to, to mum and had his tea cooked. Had his washing done, had someone to love. And I just had a flat with no one. So my ambition was, and I'll be straight, was to destroy the lot. If it killed mother, I'd, I'd, I wanted to do that. What chance has Craig got, though, being born in prison? His dad's a killer, living the lies as well, because his mum would have been manipulating him. No matter if you think she loved him, she would have still been telling him lies and filling his head with absolute shit as well. I think she told him lies for years. Be honest with you. I think mother blamed me. Uh, I wouldn't say for my dad's death. I'd say for the trouble, the aggravation. What we were done when we were younger. You know, when I used to go begging for food and outside the chip shop and outside the bookies with a guy Fawkes mask on Craig. We used to go stealing clothes off washing lines to get clothes for ourselves. You know, we didn't matter if they were two sizes too big because we didn't have things. There's people off worse than me. But that's what I went through, so yeah. So you and Craig started building a relationship again? Yeah, we did. Yeah, we started building a relationship up again. I used to go to the railway uh, nightclub with him. Uh, I knew most. I knew a lot of the doormen, so I was all right to him there. And then when he was 18, because I was involved with Mark Murray, uh, Mark Randall, sorry. And who's he? He was an Irish lad. I worked for him and his father. He, he knew a lot of people, a hell of a lot of people, and he could get anything you wanted. So, Terminals. yeah, yeah. So I introduced Craig to him. Craig got Jay, uh, Craig a job at my firm for a bit with Mark. He lasted, I think, about four months. We took uh, Craig to, to London nightclub for his 18th and we gave him his first pill and he loved it. And, he, you know, after that, he'd, he realised you, you could make money. I kept pushing his end so you could make money. I'll get as many pills as you want, Craig. You know, no problem at all. You want pills, I'll get them. You can sell them. And my, my tactics were working. He was biting. I was destroying mum in her own way because Craig got in, in, into pills, yeah. He was doing quite well on his own. He was having the posh, posh clothes, the cars. So that tyre fitter that was only earning a few quid a week apprenticeship and giving mum, what, 20 quid out of his, out of his money was suddenly getting all this. But he wouldn't tell mum where he was getting it from and he wouldn't tell mum he was part of me. Were you enjoying that feeling? I was, yeah. Yeah. I was happy because I knew bit by bit I was destroying the relationship they had, all of them. Even with a, even with a, a new husband, Paul, you know what I mean? I couldn't stand him. He thought he was our dad. And he was two years younger than me, two years older than me. You know what I mean? Trying to dictate to, to Craig what he can't do and can do. So, yeah, I was glad I was, I was, I was ripping them apart. Sharon, I never took arm Sharon. Who's that, your sister? My sister. She, I don't blame her for anything. I get angry sometimes because she says she'll do this for me and she lets me down. But I think that's because her husband. But I don't blame my sister. I blame my mum and I blame my brother and I blame my other brother. So I got Craig in the pills big time. I... Went to meet someone in London with uh, Mark, and I got a thousand pills. Now, okay, I got the thousand pills for eight quid, and people say, "Well, you're eight quid," but we got them for eight quid. 
it's no good me lying and say I got them for 10 quid or 20 quid. I got them for 8 quid. And we were selling for 15, 20 pounds. So Craig was making a lot of money. And he was getting greedy then. He wanted more. I was willing to give more as long as he kept paying. But he knocked for the 1,000 pills. So we, we were sitting in the powerhouse pub one night. Craig's not paid for these, these pills, which is, he's got to pay for. So we're sitting there and these two blokes walk in, both with long leather coats on. Powerhouse is quite busy. They're walking down, they're walking towards us. And in one of the coats, I could see a sawn off shotgun, the, 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 the head of it, you know, the, the handle. So I said to Craig, look at that. Craig jumped up, boss straight through the pub window. He went. So straight instinct, what's going on here? So I followed through the pub window. I've caught my wrist on the other side and I've split my wrist right open from there to here. So I've clapped the other side. The two men had gone running out the pub, ran to the side, looked at me and went off, please come. I was taken to uh, Bazin Hospital. And then I was taken to uh, Billericay's burn unit when I had to have internal stitches. Those two lads were two of the lads that Craig owed the money to that he didn't pay, come looking for us. So yeah, we, we, uh, we upset a lot of people. From an early age? From an early age, yeah. I was, I think, 25 and Craig was 18, coming on to 19 when we, we, you know, things started going bad. I know you've said you've set out to basically destroy your family, but do you ever feel guilty of getting Craig involved? No. No. You'll ask me at the end of the day, do I feel guilty of Craig being killed? No. No, I don't. I, it upsets me for what's happened to him, yeah. Do I miss him? Yeah, I do. But would I turn back the clock? No, because I've achieved what I wanted to achieve. I've destroyed mother. Did you ever love Craig? Oh, I loved him to bits. It was my life, yeah. It was. Do you think it's easier for you to say what you're saying to take away the pain of losing him? I don't know. Uh, because how can you love him but want to destroy him? It doesn't make sense. <laughs> It doesn't, but it does. It, it, there's a part of me that, that wanted to, to rip him apart. You with me? And it, if it weren't for me dragging Craig, uh, Craig into that game of pills and money, he'd have been a happy person probably still around now. So, yeah, I do miss him. But for what I went through in life, even the later stages being beaten up, Accused of being a grass, which I'll explain, and that being drugged, being paralysed, thought I was going to die. No, I don't miss him. I can understand that part, obviously, which we'll touch on, the stuff that he did later on in life. But you started them off in that life, and what could have been if he was just a tire fitter, maybe married, and had kids, do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I can understand, obviously, which we'll touch on later in the interview, but it's just to get the just of the whole situation and it, that's in massive respect for being completely honest because it's fucking it's a beautiful thing but it's just obviously from your own, young age the trauma the pain not having having those abandonment issues with your mum your father being killed it's your brother being the golden child and feeling left out feeling as if no one loves you that's just a bubble of hatred within you that you had with your mum but you've just wanted everybody to feel the pain that you felt yeah, the, the main person I wanted to destroy was my mother. But I couldn't destroy my mother on her own. So I had to get the circle round her. And the main circle of that was Craig. She was his angel. She's, he was loved more than anyone because he was John Kennedy's son. He was, oh, he was uh, the odd one in the family. You with me? We didn't find out. We didn't know he was John Kennedy's son. None of us knew until John Kennedy's come out and told us. But I knew if I get Craig... Michael went to live with Nan and Grenda, so we didn't see Michael. He had his own life with Nan and Greg, cruise ships, everything he went on, same as Sharon. Why did they keep, take him under the wing? Well, to be honest, I thought Michael was John Kennedy's son. Could he have been? This is what I don't know. This is what I'm trying to find out, because Michael's different bet look-wise between all of us. And when my dad was killed, my Nan and Granddad took Michael away, brought him up as a baby. Then they both worked. Why only take Michael? Why not take Sharon? They had a big enough house. So that's what went through my mind is that Michael was John Kennedy's son. He had a brilliant upbringing, Michael. Never been in trouble. Anything. Until one day, I got him to burn the school down. 
and Michael got put in prison for it. And I laughed at that. Yeah, I wanted to destroy him. And I was getting bit by bit by bit. But it never worked, did it? Because they're still around now, mother. And that's the main one I wanted to destroy. What happened with the two men and the shotguns? Uh, well, Mark, Mark Randall come and see me uh, a week later and said that if Craig didn't pay the money for the pills, they'd be back and, and there'd be consequences. So I paid the money back. I lent it off Mark and I paid the dealers back. But we couldn't get no more pills off them. Was Craig listening to you then? As no, the bigger no, brother? No, I was Craig. always a loose cannon? He started getting a loose cannon when he was late 19s, 20, hanging around with a lad called Dave Stratton, which was a, a Liverpool lovely lad, but he was a big, massive scrounger. So he was Craig's best friend. So we went to, I went to the railway pub one night. Uh, Craig turned up. There was a, a doorman there called Mick McKay, lovely bloke, probably one of the hardest men in, in Bazin in his days. He, he died in a, a car crash in the end. Uh, the nightclub was upstairs, uh, was having a good laugh, and then it was a bank holiday, and, and these mods were coming back from South End on Sea, and they come to the railway pub nightclub with a few drinks. There must have been about 20, 30 of them. And this is the first time I've seen my brother, Violent. Uh, Dave Stratton was talking to one of the mod lasses. Uh, something kicked off, so she chucked his drink over Stratton. A lad come over and gives Stratton a smack. A fight broke out. Everyone was sort of fighting everyone. I grabbed Craig and took him out the fire exit door. Took him down by the market stalls. The police turned up. Stratton was arrested. You could see him come out of the pub and went to the, to the police van. As I'm talking to Craig, looking at it, next to me, Craig's gone. Where's he gone? He's run down and he's whacked the policeman so hard, put him on the floor, grabbed Stratton in the handcuffs and buggered off with Stratton. And that's the first time I've ever seen him violent. Was that a concern for you? Or were you worried at that, at that point? No, I found it funny. It's... Were you happy it was showing a different side? I wasn't happy that I was winning in the way I wanted to make him out to be evil. I was happy in my mind because I thought, if mother would have seen that, hey, the little boy fitting tyres last week and look at him there, knocking a copper out. So, yeah, I... <laughs> it's hard to explain the feelings you feel when something goes your way you with me when our plans coming together yeah it was working for me but then, then it backfired on me so it was working yeah so uh the pill game went 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 good craig was doing well he had, he had uh i think five or six runners for him and then he he met tony tony tucker at first i met tony a couple of times lovely bloke until he started getting onto heavy gear. But Mark Randall introduced me to a, a, a chap called Conrad. I think his last name was Conrad Chaplin, an armed robber. And Conrad had a, a load of banker's drafts for sale. I think there's like 25, 27 banker's drafts. Uh, so Mark said, would you interest? So I brought the banker's drafts. And with the banker's draft, you could go and buy anything you want. This is what I was told. No problem at all. And because, one, I wanted to make money, but two, because I was losing Craig because he went with Tony. So I thought, if I get the banker's drafts, I'm going to win my brother back and carry on doing what I'm doing. So I got the banker's drafts. Uh, you had to get a ball, ball tire right. It was all done properly. Because on a ball tire right, the numbers are little tiny bearings compared to what they are now. So I got a ball tire right uh, two signatures, manager and cashier. And you can go and buy what you want with it. So I asked Craig what car he wanted. And he told me. And I said, I'll get you the car. So I went and brought the car. No problem at all. Give it to Craig. He had a nice car. BMW driving about him. And then that's um, I, I got to know Tony and Craig very well again. Because I was buying all the cars for him. And did you, f so see when Tony was around, how was his reputation then? Because people who I've spoke to who personally knew him says he was a very polite, very respectful man. Obviously the books and the movies portrayed different, but what was his actual reputation at the start? When I, when I met Tony quite a few times, he was polite, he was, wasn't loud. He let Craig do all the talking, let Craig do all the running. No, no, I've, I've never seen Tony, Tony violent until later on in life when he started taking every gear. Then he just changed. 
Were you happy that he'd went with Tony? Were you no, happy that no. relationship was building? No, I was losing him. I I didn't want Tony on the scene, but Craig needed all the doors. He needed muscle, and Tony had the doors. Because Tony was 10 years older than Craig, is that correct? Yeah, I think Craig looked up at Tony as a father figure, to be honest with you. Someone he could rely on. He couldn't rely on me. Why? Well, he phoned me one day and he said to me, he said, because I had, I had a, a company vehicle, a P1 pickup, and I had a Metro car. And he said, Come up, Bob, can I send Michael Rand to borrow one of your vehicles? So I said, Yeah. So Michael came around and said, Look, take the Metro. I didn't ask him what for or anything. I said, Take the Metro. He didn't run it about. Michael took the Metro when uh, I was in, in my flat. And about three, four hours later, Craig phoned me up and he said, uh, What you fucking said? I said, What are you on about? He said, Mark has been arrested going over Dartford, uh, Dartford Bridge with, with drugs on him. What you said to someone, you fucking said something. I said, he ain't told me anything where he's going. No, I don't know nothing. So the phone went dead. About an hour later, police turned up, uh, asked me if it, the vehicle was mine. I said, yes. Asked me if the, the drugs in the vehicle were mine. I said, no. I never heard about it. Asked me to show the documents of the car. And that was it. I thought I'd be arrested and questioned. Police. Just walked away and let me go. Went back to the police station. They've got Michael. Michael was charged with, I think, he had three bars of uh, marijuana in the back of the car. So Craig thought I grasped Craig up, uh, Michael up. But I didn't grasp anyone up. And I swear on that. I'll be truthful with anyone. I put me in. I'm going to lie. I did not grasp him up. Maybe I was being surveillance because of the cars I was getting. I was being watched. But I did not grasp my brother up. Maybe the lad who gave Michael the gear. He was under surveillance. But no, I didn't grasp Michael up. Is that where the rumours came from at the start, that you were yeah, the grass? I was the grass, so I wasn't to be trusted. Then people would say to you, well, if you're the grass, why do they still deal with, still do things with you? The two reasons they, they, they still stay with me. One, because I was getting all the vehicles for them, because I was the only one that had to do the banker's draft. I was the only one that had the banker's draft. And two, I, I was close friends with Mark Randall. Now, Mark Randall knew a lot of people. Mark Randall could get you things you wanted. He knew Tommy Savage in Ireland with me. He could get you any drugs you wanted, as long as you didn't must mess around. So they stayed friends with me, yeah. When did Pat come on the scene? I never met Pat. Uh, 90, uh, end of 93, I was sentenced to two years in prison. So 94, I was in prison. So what it was, it's another good thing. This is, I was getting cars. Any car you wanted, I could get it. Posh cars, any cars like that. So when I was in hospital, I had me, me wrist stitched up, internal stitching. I was in there for three days. Now, the doctors thought that I cut my wrist on purpose, so I had to see a psychiatrist because they thought I was a bit disturbed. So they kept me in for three days, and then Craig and Tony come to see me, see if I was all right. Craig asked me if I said anything to two men, and I said no, they left when the, the, the sirens started coming. So that was it. Then Tony went down to the, the bottom of the ward and was talking to a, a bodybuilder. I think what he had, he gave up bodybuilding, he's having his fat removed or something. So Tony was talking to him. And then Craig and Tony left and Craig said, I'll pop back tomorrow and we'll pick you up and take you, take you back home. No problem. So that, they left and this bodybuilder come down to me, he said, uh, your name's Brian Rolfe. And I said, yeah, why? He said, uh, Tony's telling me you can get any cars you want. I said, I don't know get cars, mate. He said, yeah, he said, Tony told me. So I said, no, I know what you're talking about. He couldn't kick off with it was in hospital. I know what you're talking about. He said, I saw it tomorrow. So I went back to the room. Craig and Tony turned out to pick me up, take me home. And the, the bloke come down with Tony. Tony said, he said, look, this is my fucking mate here. He wants a car, you get him a car. All right, all right, fair enough, no problem. So that was it. So we got out, and the bloke got in company. He said, I'm after a Merc. I want a, this Mercedes. I think there was about... 40 odd grand of a car I can't remember it going back some years so I said yeah I'll, I'll get you the car so I want 10 grand up front why do you want 10 grand I said well I do I put 10 grand down and I pay the rest in checks there's no suspicion yeah alright I'll do that so we arranged to meet him outside of Romford in Romford outside Mercedes deal and I already arranged two days before to, to do a deal with a car with, with the, the garage so Craig took me there uh, we parked across the road from the garage 
waiting for this lad to up. This lad turned up with his mate in another car. So I got out, went across. He gave me the money. They sat in the car. I walked into the showroom thinking, deal's done. I've made a few quid here. He's off me back, no problem. So I've talked to the salesman. The car's been all being serviced for us and it's all done. I'm going to start signing the paperwork, sitting in the office. Next minute, two men walk in, grab me and slim me on the bottom of the car. Turn around and handcuff me. Drug squad. So they told the salesman, he's uh, being arrested, he's well known for doing this, took the banker's draft and the cash, cash the 10 grand off, off the salesman, took me outside. But they're plain clothes, so the, the doorman's, ex-doorman, the bounce where he was, come running across the road, thinking I'm nicking his money. So he's come running across, what's going on here, is Shane? So the cop has flicked his badge and said, do you know this bloke? No, I don't know, mate, no, I don't. All right, well, you go away then. So they put me in back of the car. I think it was a, a Ford Orion then, got in the back of the car. So one got next to me and one was driving. And I sit in the car and I thought, fuck it, I've been arrested now. Bang to rights. Don't worry about it. I ain't gonna... So they started driving back towards Basin Police Station. But we ain't gone Basin Police Station. We've gone to my flat. And while we're driving, Craig's following behind in the car. So we've gone to the flat. They've unhandcuffed me took me out by the car, he's given me the banker's draft back. I don't care, anyone says, it's what happened, I've even named the policeman. He's given me the banker's draft back. He's took the envelope of money, and he's set there counting it, and he's given me eight grand, and put two grand in his pocket, and drove off. And Craig's watching this, all the time. So I've not tried to look at Craig, to know that I've noticed him, because I'm fucking, I'm in shit street now, because he's seen me. So I've gone into the flat, Feet and Craig had come in a minute, but he didn't. He went. It must have been about three, four hours later. Craig come back. He said, uh, what went off there? I said, I don't know. I said, they arrested me. He said, you're talking to the police, ain't you? I said, I'm not talking to the police. He said, you are. I said, what the fuck will I do with you? Nothing to do with you. Go, go on. Nothing to do with you. I said, okay. Then so I shut the door and left. And about a month later, he phoned me. He said, uh, I need you on a job with me. I'll give one more chance. So I said, yeah, no problem at all. He said, be there in my house at seven o'clock. So I said, yeah, drove around his house, went through the door, and uh, we had to give our phones to him because we're going, we're going to rob someone, so no one can have the phones, so no no contacts made with anyone, so no, there's no suspicion, no police. Yeah, no problem at all. So I give him the phone. Uh, Craig sitting there. Mark Randall sitting there. Brother Michael's sitting there. So we're playing cards and that. Craig's come in and said, uh, anyone want a bit of whiz? So Michael said, yeah, I'll have a bit. So he said, want a bit of whiz, Bryce? I said, yeah. So he said, I'll put yours in a, a bit of Ribena. So I said, yeah, no problem. So he gave me this drink and I necked it down. Cut me his I feel fucking strange. I said, what's this? And then he smacked me straight in the face, put me to the floor. I can't remember nothing like that. And I woke up in mum's bungalow in the spare bedroom, no matches, laying on the floor, and I was paralysed. I couldn't move. I could hear. My eyes were fixed on the door, but I couldn't move. So I see mum walk in, Craig walk in, and Paul walk in, and mum's going, will it be all right, be all right? And Craig's going, fuck him, it'll be all right. So for three that more or less three days, I was paralysed. I laid in my own shit and piss for three days. I think he, he gave me is it the stuff they do with horses, Catamaran or something, some other stuff. Catamaran. They'd done this to find out if I was the police informer. So they thought they'd drug me. Maybe they thought if they drug me, I'll give information out. So, yeah, they drug me. And I was for three days. I lay in that room. And then I got better. Uh, I suppose I signed up the police station. So I got arrested. Uh, they have taken the Basin Police Station. They examined me. I went back to court. I got bow again. I, I told them that I took a bad, bad bit of gear and it made me a bit... So that was it. I got bow. So I didn't speak to Craig again for another four weeks after that. But it worked out. It wasn't me that grasped. Who so, was that? I don't know. That's the truth. I, we, we all think that the other bloke was on surveillance. The one who owns the scrapyard in Kent. We think he's brothers on surveillance. So it wasn't me that, that shot Michael. But Craig still couldn't understand why the police arrested me and the Mercedes dealer, took me back to my flat, 
and give the money and the banker's draft back to me and not arresting me for it. So that was still playing the head. That was still playing in my head. Yeah, because I couldn't suspicious. understand it. Yeah, that's suspicious. You with me? I can understand it. Why did they not take all the money? That's what I don't understand. Was the coppers playing a game with everyone? They knew I was being watched by my brother. So they knew they had me. If I needed help, because they knew what Tony and Craig were like, dangerous people. So they had me in, in their, their, little, their little net, as we say. So mother phoned me about two weeks later. She said, Brian, look, I need a favour. So I'd do anything for me, Mum. I want her back. Still? I, yeah. But I thought you hated them. I do, but I still want the love. I want to get in, inside their heads. I want them to be part. Let them think that I'm back to normal. I'm that person that, you know, that forgives them. Do you think if your mum did say sorry and showed you love, you would have forgot everything and tried to make amends with everyone? No. Or did you still have that hate in your heart? To I've still got the hate now. I'll explain the reason yeah, why. So, mother's phoned me. Now, mum's friend is a, a lady called Sue. She's a lovely lady. She's got a, a boy and a daughter. Well, her husband uh, went to Africa to learn people out there to do plus and never come back. So Sue had a mortgage. She was skin. So mum said to me, Brian, look, can Sue come and buy one of the cars with you on the banker's draft? Give us, give us some money. And I thought, how does she know about that? Well, Craig must have told her. So I said, yeah, no problem. I had a lot of respect for Sue. So I picked Sue up. I said, we're going to go to South End and we're going to go and buy a BMW that Craig wants. I said, all you do is you go in the house, you be polite, you talk to you, you have a look around the car, you have a test drive, he lets you. And then you say to him in the day, yeah, I'm interested. Will you accept a banker's draft? He says, yeah, get his name, we're back tomorrow. That was it. She went in the house. For about an hour, I sat down the road. She'd come out all down the road, got in the car. She said, yeah, well, brilliant. You take a banker's draft. Brilliant. About the next day. I've typed out the banker's draft. So I've dropped near the house. I said, go in there, do the deal, drive the car down the road, then follow me. So I've gone round to, round the back to like a, a bowling green to use a toilet. As I come out the bowling green, <laughs> there's police all there. Brian Rolfe said, yeah, you're under arrest for fraud and deception. What are you on about? Put me in the car, took me up to the old boy's house, brought Sue out the house. So as soon as Sue got in the house, she told me there was a bloke there. Now, I can't remember if she said it. He said it was his nephew or his son. So they sat there doing things. As soon as she passed that banker's draft over, she's committed the offence. So she was arrested the bed front. So they've arrested us. We're in South End. They took the South End police station. I've gone in there. Uh, Sergeant seen me, interviewed. Uh, Sue's getting bail. First offence, never been troubled for. So she's she's getting bail. She'll probably get a caution later after, after first investigation. Me, I'm not getting bail because there's stacks and stacks of cars outstanding. Fair enough. I've been caught bang to rights. I could sit in the sound of, how the fuck did they find out? Sue must have fucked up. She must have made a mistake. How did she make a mistake? It's easy. She's my bank. Let's drive, drive the car. So I was sitting there for a few hours. Then the door opened. Uh, an officer with an officer I knew, Jack Bowler's, uh, Jack Bowler's here to see you. So he took me to a room, sat in the room, and Jack Bowler's there. He said, how are you, Brian? I said, all right. So there's another officer in there. And then a door opened. He said, I want to meet two, two people. And then a door opened, and these two officers walked in. And it was the same officers that nipped me from the Mercedes car. So they walked in, and they sat down. And they said, look, we can help you here, Brian. We can make all this go away if you help us. I said, what do you mean, all go away? All your charges, make them all go away. You just help us. New identity, put you anywhere in the country you want, help us. So I'm going to be straight. I sat and I thought, that sounds fucking interesting. So they went, and I was sitting there with Jack, and Jack said, look, I'll be here in the morning, pick you up in the morning. I said, oh, I'm, not, I'm not going to get bail, Jack. He said, you're going to get bail. I'll pick you up in the morning. So next day, come, breakfast come round. Officer got me, took me to the front desk. Uh, Sergeant said, we're banning you further inquiries. Now, they got me banged to rights, I think, and Jack Bowler standing there. He said, I'll give you a lift back to Basildon. So he gave me a lift back to Basildon. And on the way back, got back to the police station, he said, listen to me, take the deal. Your brother's no good for you. Tony's no good for you. Your mother's no good for you. Get out of it. Get away from it. Don't, don't stop destroying your life. Take the fucking deal. 
So I went back to the flat and I sat there for and I thought, you know, this sounds good. What have I got to do for this? So a few hours later, the officers turn up, let them in, Gary Duckrell, head of regional crime squad, uh, Essex Drug Squad, regional crime squad. He comes in, sits there with another officer, a blonde ear. He said, right, I want you to plant some drugs on your brother. He said, then we're nick them. They're out your way. We have get your charges dropped. You've got a new life. So I said, you want me to plant drugs? He said, yeah. And my life changes. Yeah. And I thought about it. I thought, you know, should I make a new start, get away from all this? But there's one side of me still saying, no, you haven't finished what you started with mother. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll think about it. So the officer left, come back, and he come back with a bag of pills. I think it was about 3,000 pills, they're capsules. And he said, I want you to put these in your brother's vehicle. So we got to do, put them in his vehicle without him knowing, we'll do the rest. So I said, yeah, no problem. So I opened the bag and I pulled one out and he started laughing. He said, there's nothing in them, Brian, they're empty capsules. He said, we're not that fucking stupid. So I said, you want me to put these empty capsules in his car? Yeah, we'll sort the rest. I said, okay, then no problem. So they left. And I sat there for a while, thinking and thinking. And I thought, no, nah. I chucked him in the bin. So I knew I was going to be arrested for the cars now because I've just chucked that away and I'm not helping the police. So about three months later, the cop had come back to me. I said, I'm not doing it. No, nope, not interested. He said, okay, you'll get your court date. So I got magistrates at South End named up a chance for Crown Court. But prior to that, Tony and Craig wanted a, a camper van to start bringing drugs back from abroad. So I said, yeah, I'll get a camper. We never brought things on our doorsteps because if you buy a car on a doorstep and it goes wrong, someone sees that car, they know where it is. So we never brought a car on the doorstep. So I got in contact uh, with a couple, lovely couple in Manchester, selling a camper van. So I got the train down to Manchester, uh, went to a lovely house, went inside, met them, had a chat, uh, looked around the camper van, had a cup of tea with them, lovely people, giving the bankers draft, got in the camper van, drove off the out the, the driveway, down the road, me laughing, mid off thinking, you fucking idiots, and then waving to me, thinking, oh, what a lovely lad he is. Drove back to, to London, to Basildon. Here's your camper van. Brilliant. We're going to start bringing drugs back in it. Yeah, no problem. You are. So this is how I'm building my trust back with my brother again because I've got to take that camper van to Holland to bring some gear back. So the first time I went in the camper van, I went with Mark Randall. We went from Harwich to Holland. Uh, Mark met some chap who took him to meet Tommy Savage. I didn't meet Tommy. I stayed outside. I think Mark brought only a small pack, about four or 5,000 pills, put them in the camper van. Now, it had fixed beds, so the bed come up, and it's like a uh, a box, a hollow box there. So we put them in there, covered them up, drove back, no problem at all. Deal went down, brilliant. So then a month later, Craig wants to do it again, but this time he wants to go from Hull. So I said, yeah, okay, I'll come with you. So he went to Hull. Uh, we parked down by the where the ferries are, but we, we didn't leave two hours in the morning, so... We went into a pub and we asked the bloke in the pub, where's the best place to go for a drink? And that's where we stay in the camper van. He said, go down the road, there's a pub called the Eldie Grey. He said, you like it in there? She went down to the Eldie Grey. And it was a strippers, strippers bar. It was, it was quite good. Sorry. <laughs> quite quite good bar. So we had a few drinks in there and then went to the taxi rank. And I didn't fancy going to Holland again. So I was in the taxi rank and I was thinking, so how am I going to get out of this? Just out of the blue, this bloke in the taxi ramp was whacking his missus. For some reason, they're arguing. Now, I don't fight. I don't like fighting. So I just walked down in the queue and punched the bloke to the floor. The boats end up screaming, saying, what I do that? He's done nothing wrong. I got arrested, put in the police cell. I didn't go to Holland. They went to Holland. Uh, I had to get the train back to Baz the next day. I was being dis uh, discharged from the police station. So that was it. That was the deal. And then they got another fat, uh, a couple to go to Holland to pick up a big bulk. And that was from Harwich. And they got caught on the way back. I think they got coming back through Dover. 
He went to Canterbury and she went to Holloway. But that was a big bulk of gear. It was never paid for. So that was another person, the upset. But why did you not... So if the cop... If you hate your brother, you want to destroy his life, your mum's life, why did you not make the deal with the coppers then? Because I'm destroying Craig. I want not destroy my mother. She would not have been destroyed if he went to prison? No, well... And why did you think the coppers seen you as a weakness to then turn? Yes, yeah. I think... Well, I think Jack... Because Jack Bowler knew my past... I think they approached Jack Bowler first and Jack Bowler said, yeah, I think Brian will do this, yeah. So I think Jack Bowler's pushed him into the idea, look, get rid of this for him and they put him onto the drugs in his brother's vehicle. How did they know that your mum wasn't good for you? Right. The reason that is because when I was 21, 22, George Frederick Riggle was arrested for abusing kids for the system. It's, it, it, it's on the internet now. You look at all the schools that have abuse kids our school's on it and his name's next to it George Frederick he got put in prison so the two lads I don't want to name the two lads I think one jumped in front of a train and killed himself uh, because of it but one's still alive now he could be married I don't know he told the police all three of us got arrested uh, abused as, as kids uh, Jack Bowler come and see me this is how I really first got to, to know Jack and asked me to make a statement against George Frederick Ridd about the, must, me being abused, uh, I wouldn't. The reason why I wouldn't do it, one, because I've become an adult. I didn't want people knowing my past. I didn't want my family knowing I was abused. I didn't want my brother know I was being abused. And people I live around. So, no, I didn't make a statement. So my dear mother, thinking of pound notes, turned and said, I'll make a statement. He's confessed everything to me. So Jack Bowling ran to her. She made a statement, but nothing ever come of it. He didn't stand up in court. So see when you punched the guy, was that planned so he didn't have to go to Holland? Yes. It it Yeah, because I don't I don't fight, so it was an opportunity for me to get out of what I was gonna get. I knew I was gonna get in trouble for fighting. But it's just it just happened. It was just there at that that second. That would then heighten them to say that you were a grass though, if you get out of that and someone's been caught. Because in my mind, I'd be thinking, okay, you've set that up again. I would have blamed you. Fair enough. Because to call that shot, to get out of it, knowing that you're going away, because you want to fly under the radar, you're not there to cause trouble, but to then cause trouble, and it's something out of turn that you wouldn't normally do, to then get out of it, and then someone's been caught with the shipment. I think what it was, the fact is that I knew we were being watched, you with me, by drug squad, uh, the first one we were lucky and I didn't want to push my chance on the second one I was already up for, for cars going to court and I didn't want to be caught coming through abroad or going to uh, 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 prison abroad so whether they thought I was I was still the grass that's up to them I mean I, I can't change their feelings towards me you with me but no it wasn't because of that I didn't want to be up in charges and I had that feeling in my head we were still being watched but we wasn't being watched the second time. It was the third time that we were being watched. You see, the thing is, though, when you're under surveillance, they let you away with shipments, one, two. They need to build a case of information to then get a conviction. So sometimes they let it fly under the radar to then catch the bigger shipment because their, their phones would have been surveillance. Probably cars bugged back then. And people speak out of school, especially if you're at parties and everyone, because I know they ended up on the, bad on the drugs. So they'd have been speaking out of school all the time. And the thing about the coppers, they know everything. They fucking know everything. Who says what, where the meets are. They know everything. They've just not got enough people to then target everything, all the information that they have. They, they build up cases to then bring everybody down together. And uh, so when they get caught in Amsterdam, what was Craig saying to you then? He didn't say anything. He didn't kill Craig didn't really accuse me of being a grass after the, the drug inside of it. He had his suspicions because of the police officers arresting me for the Merc. But he, the main, his main concern was it wasn't me that grassed Michael up. You with me? But he, still, he was still confused. And he, he must have still had in his mind that I was, I was an informer because of the officers that, that arrested me for the Mercedes but let me go. Now, people are going to think that. Well, you must have said something to him, Brian. You must have been a police informer. 
But at that stage, I wasn't a police informer. If I was, I'd put me out and say, yeah, I was a police informer. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not ashamed of what I've done in life. I'm not going to lie and say I wasn't then because I wasn't. Later on, I become a police informer through the story, yeah. But then I wasn't, no. Um, when did the, the drugs start taking their toll on Craig and Pat and, and Tony? When they started getting into heavy gear, heroin. Did you smack. see the difference in Craig? In Craig, I did, yeah. Craig got more violence and violence. I had to go and pick a car up one day, uh, an XR3i it was, and I had to deliver it to uh, Romford to a lockup that Craig and Tony had. Uh, so this is where the camper van was normally kept. So I got the car, went to uh, Romford, got to the lockup. Uh, their vehicle was outside, so I knew they was inside. So I went inside with the keys, given the keys, told them that the car was there. As I walked in, they had a, a black lad. He couldn't be no older than 19, 20, tied up in a chair. Uh, blood all ran his face where Tony had been belting him. So I just turned and said, look, the keys are here. I'm going. And Tony said, you fucking stay there and wait. So I had to stay there. I was scared, yeah. I stayed there. Craig's gone over to like a little kitchen area, boiling the kettle. Kettle's boiled. He's walked out and he's, he's tipped it over the lad's legs and burnt the legs legs with boiling hot water and that made me sick I was sick there I vomited I wanted to walk out but I couldn't walk out they wouldn't let me go I was scared of them did they not knock your teeth out did they not pistol whip you yeah what it was later on as we're going down uh, they kept Craig kept giving me good irons every now and Tony gave me a, a, a couple so why I don't know. Maybe, maybe they, they thought I was the grass. They, I don't know. Did you ever think about killing them yourself? No, I'm a coward. You say that, but you stabbed a teacher. You've you've been in prison. That was just that was you've just stupid, done stupid anger. I've been in prison quite a few times. For, for yeah, but yeah, uh, when you say that, like I say, you've been through <laughs> some shit. You've done some shit, and you always put yourself back in that environment. Do you know what I'm saying? It's not a case of you're a coward. You've done some bad shit yourself you were involved in bad shit you were willing to go to Amsterdam pick up gear you've stabbed a teacher you've you've been in prison you've done boss though you've come through a lot of shit in your life you're no fucking saint by any means but you've still overcome a lot of shit so I wouldn't say you were a coward because you've these were known proper gangsters back in the day there's no denying it they've done a lot of bad stuff do you know what I'm saying done, but you put yourself back there it's hard to understand why you kept going back for more punishment <laughs> yeah I kept putting myself back there every time I know a lot of people have said that to Mark and his, his wife Jackie say to me Brian why do you keep doing it why just get away from it look at the state of you every day we see you at work you know you, you've got this black eye you've got that cut there you do this or, or you're being accused of this get away from it leave your mother but I couldn't I what? can't I can't I, I don't know why some part of me was turned around and saying you haven't finished what you set out to do You've got to finish it. Whether it killed me, I had to finish what I was doing. Did you ever think about killing your mum? No. No. And I'll be honest, I didn't know. Maybe I should have done. It would have solved a lot of things then, wouldn't it? Uh, uh, when we're young, we do, we do silly things. Uh, we get control. I don't care what people say. Yeah, you, people control people. Some people are strong and don't let them. I was weak, so I let, them, I let them control me. I enjoyed being controlled because I felt wanted. You understand that? Yeah, you know I mean, I, I, I was losing Craig to Tony, and by me still being part of it and saying, yeah, I'll do this, I'm your Joey, I'll do that, I'll do that. They were using me, but I couldn't see they were using me. I thought Craig wanted me. But you were also using them because you had a wicked plan in yeah, your mind also. I didn't let them know that. Of course, but that's really? more manipulative than them. Yeah. So even though you say you're weak, you were still going with an agenda to destroy them. And you were playing the card of a joy. Yeah, I, I, I probably deserved half what I got. Yeah, I admit that. But I need to get revenge for what I went through as a kid. I didn't deserve any of that. No kid does. You know what I mean? It's 
you, do, you, you don't deserve to be brought in this world and go for what a lot of kids go for, yeah, but don't speak out. Yeah, so maybe I should have killed my mother. I might have felt better for it. I don't know. I can't answer it. Why did they keep beating you, though? Well, because they thought, I think they thought I was the grass. And I'm going to say, yeah, okay, they thought I was the grass because of the police officers that give me a lift and give me the money back. They kept thinking I was an informer. They they might have thought, well, the Amsterdam job coming back from Holland, you with me, when they come back through Dover, I got arrested. They might have thought that I might have said something, but I didn't. I'm not scared to admit that I, I, I shopped them on two occasions. I'm not scared to admit that. I'll admit it. And I'll give the officers names I phoned up. And I'll give the phone numbers that I phoned up. I'll admit all that. But I wasn't the police informer. I don't understand, though, why they would still give you jobs if they thought you were a grass. I don't get that either. Yeah, Could well, it possibly be that one of them was an informer? Well, it worked out. They both, both, both police informers. Tony had an officer and Craig had an officer. Craig had Jack Bowl and Tony had someone else, an officer. So they was, they was all, all shitting on each other. The reason why they kept me, and you're going to say this, Mark Randall wouldn't deal with them direct. He only deal with me. And Mark trusted me. And I respect him for that, him and Jackie. You know, I, cl I class them as the parents or the friends of fame I never had. So, yeah. But the fame thing was they kept me because of the banker's drafts. If they were ever short of cash, Brian, we need that car. That's going to make us 20K, 10K, 5K. I get it. I wouldn't argue. I'll go and get it. So that's, they use me like I use them. I use them to get back at my mother and destroy her. And they use me to benefit what they wanted out of life. They didn't tell me a lot. They didn't tell me everything they were doing. You know, we like when I, I went to Jackie's one day and what it was, I was sitting in the flat and they come round, booted the door down and they said a job went wrong and they thought I, I grasped them up and I was sitting there saying, I didn't, I haven't mentioned anything, nothing about it. I was screaming, shouting upset i said nothing and they're sitting there and tony's got his arm around me yeah i fucking think you did and, and he pulls a gun out and there i am pissing myself and next to me gets up and he gets the button smacks me straight in the teeth my teeth go through my tongue and me bit my tongue and i can't breathe i'm on the floor screaming and craig walks up kicks me in the face and goes but it's only because a neighbor heard it all that she called paramedics because my teeth went through my tongue i could have suffocated on my own blood so, yeah, I went to see Jackie and Mark at work the next day, and Mark said, Look, Jackie said, I'm not having this no more. We're going to set them up. I'll have a word with Mark. We're going to set these up. We're going to make them pay for what they're doing. You can't keep doing this. So I went along with it, and we set up a robbery job in London. Some lads that had a lot of gear. We set the job up. There was me, Craig, uh, Mark Randall in one car. There was Tony in another car. I went to London, pulled up down the street outside this uh, house, Mark out by the club, that cake out by the club, guns off, off they went. I sat in the car, keep the engine running, went in the house, 20, 30 minutes later, come running out of a bag, chucks in the bag, fucking drive, I drove. Two lads come running out of the house. There was no, no gunfire, then two lads come in running out of the house. They're chasing the car, we, we've gone, they're not catching up, I can see them in the mirror. Then I had a gunshot, then I see Tony come down the road and one off the, off the side of the road, run him over. We went to Langdon, parked the cars up, Craig made a phone call to uh, Kevin Whitaker, get rid of these cars. Kevin come round, sorted the car, got rid of them. Went back to Craig's house. We had to walk back. They got they got a lift back. We got 500 quid for that. They got a bulk of gear. But the gear belonged to three brothers. It was them we ripped off. So we knew there'd be a massive outcome out of this. I was happy. So you set up the robbery for them? Mark set up the robbery, and so I agreed to it. Take it from a well-known family, yeah. so there would be backlash of them then yeah. getting killed? Yeah. How much gear was it? I don't know. It was a, a rough guess, 10,000 pills, load of coke. I, d I never see it. It was in bags. I, n I never see what they but there was money. When they got back to, to uh, Craig's house, all we see was loads of money on the, on, on the table. They were sitting there giggling, canning it. So we turned and said, where's ours? And they give us £500 each. And Mark said, is that what I'm fucking getting? And Tony turned around and said, well, fuck off, and he get fuck all. So we left. 
So, in a way, I think Mark was getting a bit sick and tired of him as well. Billion. But Mark was using me as the angle to do things where... Everybody's it, using each other. Yeah. Everybody's yeah. using each other. Everybody's an informant. Everybody, nobody's safe. And that life of crime, listen, nobody's safe. We know through the years now, look at all the mafia guys. I've interviewed a few of them. I've been over there. And some of them have done 20, 30 murders. They all, they all turn. They all turn on each other. The coppers knew everything. Everybody was informers. It's it's unbelievable in a life of crime. So-called gangsters, but yet there's not, not really any, or any tough men. There's not, not really not any now. loyalty. No, no there's um, no loyalty. So why were they doing kamikaze jobs as well? Why were they going for jobs that you were saying, potentially they thought it was a grass, but yet listening to what you've got to say about a robbery? Why were they doing those robberies either? I think... They were losing a lot of their suppliers because they weren't paying them. So they were bumping everybody? Yeah, they were bumping people off. And because the fact they was high on drugs all the time, it was an easy way. Let's go and fucking rob Tommy down the road. You know, we're not going to rob him. We've got Tony, we've got Crow, we've got Gun, yeah, we've probably got everything. Yeah, so they trusted me and they trusted him up, but they didn't trust it. They didn't trust me, but they trusted me. Well, they got to lose to go on a job and think someone's got something. And they're, they're at home sitting with all these drugs that we've just done this and we're big heroes. And what about Donna Jaggers? Donna, at and first... That's, that's uh, Craig's partner of yeah, six years yeah. or seven years. First of all, when I first met her, she was a lovely lass, you know, do anything for anyone. Then over a period of time with Craig, uh, she had a little lad called Alex. Uh I used to take him out to South in Seafront sometimes at weekends when Craig and I did. Well, Craig didn't want Alex because Alex wasn't these. So Donna had to give Alex away. So he come to me and he said, do you, do you want Alex? Because you, you don't want no kids. Can't have, I told him I couldn't have kids, okay, because I didn't have any. So I said, no. So Alex went to live with Donna's mum and dad. But yeah, they, 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 she gave Alex up. And since that day she gave Alex up, I disowned her. Because Craig said, I don't want him in my life. You don't do that to your own son. So she gave Alex up. Uh, and Georgie, lovely little girl. Uh, when I'm, I took Donna on a couple of jobs with me to pick up some pills. Uh, only small amounts from people, but we used Georgie. We used to put her in a, a chair in the back of the car. We used to put the pills under the cover and sit Georgie on it. So we, 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 we was all as bad as each other. I'm not going to lie, you with me? Yeah, we used Georgie, we used Donna. But Craig, like, no, you, you look at all these. See, I've kept quiet for 20 odd years. People say, well, you've come out of the woodwork now. Let's get something straight. I come out of the woodwork in 96. So I haven't kept quiet. And then I was at home one day in a Cosponton magazine. A woman come and see me and offered me £10,000. Going back some years now to do a story with my brother. And I said no, because I've met a beautiful wife. She knows about my past, but she don't want no aggravation. So, because we had a, a, a lad, the idea was to change our name by Deep. We only changed by Deep. I think it was that 200 pounds. That's all it was. So we changed it. And I kept out of it. I didn't, Debbie didn't want me in it, and I kept out of it. It's only over the last year I've begged my wife to try and understand how I feel and what I'm going through to let me in on this. And she has done. She, she's... She's not happy with it because I wouldn't say that I'm on the phone 24-7, but, yeah, I do go home at night time and I sit there texting people, texting me and I'm answering, yeah, Deb, sorry. And it's rude and it's wrong. I don't have let take over my life as such. But I just want to get my story out, Craig's story out. And people say to me, well, you, you're you talking about your brother, you've done his slagged him off, but you don't want me to come in and turn and say, yeah, he was a lovely lad, he used to run errands for the old girl down the road, do her shopping here and take her there. I'll tell you how Craig was. He was the biggest fucking arsehole going, and I'm sorry for swearing. You know, he got to that stage where him and Tony thought they were untouchable. Now, I didn't know Pat, and I'm not going to say I did. You know, they got to that stage where they, they thought they were untouchable. They thought they were the biggest of all. Even people that tried to warn them and advise them, it was by and nah, we do it our way and our way only. And the, 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 come on top for them. No one knows the truth, how it come on top. No one knows who did it. What about Kevin Whitaker? Right. What was the death of Kevin Whitaker? Because I know Craig gets the blame of that. He killed him. Craig, There's Craig, other sort Craig. of rumours kick about, but what is the story of Kevin Whitaker? Right. 
Craig and Kevin Whitaker used to be close friends, really close. Kevin used to be a, a, a runner for Craig, and sometimes he got gear for Craig and that. Now, take Tony out of the picture, take uh, Pat out of the picture. They, they're no part of Kevin Whitaker's death at all. Craig got it into his head because of too much drugs that he thought Donna was having an affair with Kevin Whitaker. They both denied it, but he kept building up and building up, and he said, through paranoid, being paranoid and being paranoid. And he was so convinced that Donna was, because Donna slung him out a couple of times, and he went round the house and Kevin was there. Kevin went round to see Craig, but Craig wasn't there, so he would stay and have a cup of coffee with Donna. That's all it was. So Craig thought they were having an affair. So the only way Craig used to, to get information out of people, I don't know, he must have been watching some films on telly or something, was to drug people. So he drugged Kevin Whitaker, the same stuff he drugged me, to get to find out if Donna was having an affair. In his house, with Donna sitting there, it went wrong. So they panicked. They hired a car, panicked, and dumped him on, on the motorway and left him there. Craig and Donna did that. And they both got away with it. Pat had nothing to do with it and Tony had nothing to do with it. Craig told Tony what he'd done when no one could find Kevin Whitaker and then questions were asked where, why Kevin was dead. Kevin never injected himself. So yeah, Craig done it all over a so-called affair that never happened as far as I know. If it did, no one ever told me. But drugs make you paranoid. Could Craig have potentially tried to kill you and he injected you that time? I think he did. Be honest with you, and I think deep down that my dad was watching over me and pulled me through it. You know, I've got a mother standing there that had me from birth, stand there giggling as I'm laying paralyzed on the floor in my own, you know, piss and shit for days, three days, not even changing me or feeding me. And that's a mother. If it had been her on the floor paralyzed, I'd have put a pillow over his head and solved the problem. But yeah, maybe he was trying to kill me. I don't know. But I pulled through. I was lucky. It's all dark and messy though, isn't it? Like, like from start to middle to end, it's all crazy. Like, when did it come on top four? Tony and Craig and Pat, were they, were they, because they've caused, they've caused so much destruction and had so many enemies, it could have been anybody. Well, it could have been anybody. So when did you realise... Did you always know that they were going to get took off the numbers? No, no, I didn't know. I went to prison in 94, Pat come out in 94. I come out... And How long was Pat doing? I think he got seven years for robbery or something, I'm not sure. So did, was he friends before he got the jail with them? No, apparently he was friends with uh, Mickey, Mickey Steele and that. So he Mickey was, Steele was friends with Pat, too? Yeah, yeah, and Nipper and that. I don't know how Tony and Pat met, to be honest with you, because I wasn't around when it happened. I don't think Tony knew Pat before. I think Craig knew Pat before it all went down, but I don't think Tony did. But they they become a unit that thought no, they could, no one could touch them. They thought they could go around and everything they touched or done, they destroyed. And they didn't give any 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 thought about it. They didn't give who they hurt. You with me? How much steroids was Craig taking? Well, Craig used to be a stick. I, I've got I, I put photos online. It was like a matchstick until he got into drugs then got into training with Tony and he was well on it but so was their mate Colton I mean they, they was all doing the gym together you and me so I think they just carried on and just got all big lads so you were in prison 94 yeah I went down for the car because I wouldn't plant the drugs on them yeah I got two years at Chelmsford Grand Court so I went to, <laughs> I went to Chelmsford prison my brother Michael was in there for the cannabis so when I got there uh, Michael was working the kitchens. The officer said, do you want to work in the kitchens with your brother? So I said, yes, I work in the kitchens. So I worked in the kitchens. We had a joint cell. There must have been about, say, seven cells on that landing. And it was just all kitchen staff. So we in the kitchens. And then one day, dinner time, you get locked up for a, an hour and you go back in the kitchens. And there's a big blackboard in front of the, front of the cells. So I've come out, the cell, and it's on the blackboard. Brian Rolf. You fucking grass. And I'm amazed. I'm looking at this thing. 
panicking. Who's fucking put that on there? Who's put this? So I turned around to Mike. I said, you put that on the thing? He said, how do you? I've been with you in here. I said, how's that going? He's like, I'm there rubbing it off, quit rubbing it off. And the lads are laughing. I'm rubbing it off. And I'm right, so the lads, did you put it on there? No, we ain't put it on there. No, no, none of us are putting it. So someone's putting around in chance of prison, which you can't do, but I'm a police informer. Writing it on Blackpool so people walk past on the landing and see it. Fucking Brian's a police informer. So I said to the officer, look, I'm not having this put me in the cell. I was scared. So I put me in the cell. And then a day later, the officers come and got me and said, uh, your solicitor's here to see you. So they took me out and I'm walking out and I could hear little remarks, grass, grass, grass. And I know my life is in fear now because I need to take someone walking with a, a load of hot boiling water sugar in it or a blade or something and I, I'm done for something that I ain't done yet. So I've gone to the, this room, we've gone to a room and who's sitting there? Gary Duckrell again. He said, uh, we've had, we know about the uh, the ball business who said we can uh, we can help you move you to an open prison this is all it's all on record I'm not going to lie move you to open prison get you out of here yeah please yeah get me out of here fucking hell get me out quick he said but when you come out you work for us you all pass out yeah yeah no problem get me out get me out get me out so that was it I was shipped out the next day to open prison and I went no one knew me I got on my life I come out of prison uh, January I think it's Second week in January, uh, I went back to my flat. It was destroyed. All my belongings were gone. Uh, that all sold. Mother sold the lot. So I had nothing. So I started from scratch again. So, but prior to that, before I went in prison, I've just jumped a bit. I'll explain. Before I went in prison, Craig said to me one day, can I borrow your pickup truck? I'm going fishing. Craig used to love fishing. So I said, yeah, you can borrow it and go fishing. I'll have to borrow your car because I'm working in South End on a flour mill. I've got to work Saturday, Saturday night, uh, Friday night into Saturday. Yeah, no problem. So I've took his XR3i and I've gone to work. And on the way home, it must have been about six in the morning. I've come to the slip road off the uh, A127. And I've come a bit tight and I've clumped the curb with a wheel. So I've got out and I've buckled the wheel. Fucking hell. And I've got all my tools in the back and the big, huge market, uh, car boot across the road. And I can't do anything. I said, look, I only live down there. I'll go and get some help. So I've gone home. I phoned Craig. I told Craig, look, yeah, we'll get Paul. Paul knows about mum's boyfriend, knows about cars. So we've gone down to the car. It's gone. Someone's took the car. So Craig said, well, you better phone the police station. So I said, well, so I need me tools. Phone. So I phoned Baz and police station. I said, have you got uh, an XR3 registration? Yeah, we got it here. Do you want to come and collect it? I said, yeah, no problem at all. I said, I do apologise. So I just get, went down there, got to the desk, told them that Mick had got me car here. So yeah, come in, open the door, something through, put me in a cell. So I'm sitting there, I think, what's happened here? Come and got me, he said, that, that car's a ringer. I said, it ain't a ringer. He said, how come the registration on the headlights is different than the registration on the car? So what Cain, uh, Craig did was change the registration, but didn't look at the headlights so that, yeah, the car was stolen. So I got done for the car. Uh, I went home and said to Craig, you have to go and tell the truth. I'm not getting done for this. I'm already up for these cars now. I'm going to look at some time. So Mark got a message off mother on the phone, turned around and saying, well, you've been to prison once. It wouldn't help you for taking the blame for your brother. You're the one that smashed it up. So I got an extra three months on top of that. So when I went to prison, I, I, I come out. Did this, they ever question going to an open straight away? Did anybody ever question that? No one knew. No one knew where I went. At least I was ghosted. Michael didn't know where I went. Did you not have any visitors? No, not in this one. I went straight there, done my time, and come out. Did you get any letters from Craig or anything? No, no, no not not this one. No, for not. I didn't let no one know where I was. Because how am I going to explain? I've just been shipped and out in prison. One minute I've, I've gone to see Cilicia, my, my gear's still all in the cell, and then next day I'm being ghosted out. So no, I didn't say anything. Did you, how were you quoted in, in prison with your brother and the reputation that he had? Was people fearful from you because of who your brother was? No, no. We, uh, we had a, a visit once. Uh, Craig come and see us on visit. And there was some bloke in prison that jumped out, uh, chucked his table aside and, and said to Craig, I fucking want you. You, you owe me. So straight away we thought, oh, we've got trouble here. What's, what's Craig done? 
So Craig just got up and said, and walked out. But we had the problem. But we was in the kitchen, so no one could get to us. The only way they could get to us is we went to gym or exercise. So no, we, we had no aggravation. But that was the only time we was a bit worried. Was Craig ever in prison? Never been in prison in his life. Never been, never been done for anything. The only time he got done was for assault. Uh, he had to sign in at Gray's police station. Okay, disqualified driver. He drives to the police station. He gets out the vehicle. Two uh, CID are there. All right, Craig, how are you? Oh, look, he's disqualified. Let him go. Craig drives home. He gets pulled by the police. He gives my brother's name, Michael. The officer turns and said, we got CR on your name. Your name's Craig. They radio it through. We got Craig Rolf here. To arrest him. No, let him go. The corruption of the police in this case is unbelievable. What about the Leah Betts thing with the ecstasy? I know nothing about that. I wasn't around when that happened. I don't think for one second that uh, Mark Murray in any, has any involvement in it. I think, all honesty, it's down to a certain doorman that had full control of everything. I don't even think the pills belong to those three. I think it's just been pushed onto them because they're out of the way. So Leah was a young girl who took an ecstasy and died, but her father was a police officer? Yeah, she died of access water to her brain. Is it 12 pints? It wasn't the pill that she called, it was the actual water. Yeah, her dad was uh, a firearms officer in London. So How long before, when Craig and Pat and Tony were killed, did this happen? How long before it happened? What, the, girl the young died? girl, yeah. She died before they were killed. Yeah, but how long? I think it was a matter of months. It wasn't long. I know uh, her dad went on and on a, a telly, which I don't blame the bloke. I mean, you've lost your daughter and put out quite a few partial sentences to people. Uh, but look at the pain you've had, what you've went through. You're willing to destroy your brothers, your mum, what you've went through. Imagine the pain what that dad went through. So even though with A3 being killed, it's always been a possibility the coppers were involved. Well... Since I've come out, and I'll be straight with you, since I've come out on this and I'm doing my little videos and things are kicking off, I haven't heard from Mark committed suicide, Mark Randall. I haven't heard for, from Jackie from years. Jackie's come out talking to me. Uh, I'm talking to a police officer that used to work at Basildon Police Station as a sergeant. Uh, I won't give his name at the minute until he gives me the go-ahead. Now, he's put something in my head which stands to sense to me they were taking down that lane and Lira's best dad was there and he blew him away that's why it's all corrupt and all the, I mean when they were blown away okay I, I think her dad did it I think her dad was waiting down that lane for them to turn up I don't think it was a deal I think they were taken down that lane the person got out of the vehicle he opened the door and he blew him away a firearms expert he's not stupid he knows how the machine works no forensics at all there's only a train to print. In the morning, uh, my brother's vehicle's on tracker. He's being tracked everywhere he goes by a drug squad. In the morning, an officer goes down. An hour before they were found, finds the bodies, phone radio through to his senior officer, leave it, let the public find them. And that's not telling me that's... There's not something wrong going on there. They pull Craig for driving while he's qualified. Let him go. Pat Tate never got nicked for the assault on the pizza person. Let him go. The corruption, and I'm Bob straight, from the police is unbelievable. When I, when I, in 96, I moved to Ripley. Uh, I got a job for Balfe BT. I was a bit stupid. I went out drink driving. I got pulled for drink driving. I went to Alfton Police Station. Uh, Charles for drink driving. I was due to be discharged from the police station, pending a, 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 a court hearing at Alpherton. As I was going out, I was told I couldn't go. There's two officers from Basin coming to see me. I stayed in the police cell all day. Uh, about six o'clock, Jack Bowler turned up, another officer. Uh, we're taking you back to Basin and you're wanted on a, a burglary charge. This is what I'm being old on. Well, I've never done a burglary as such in my life, so yeah, fair enough. So in the next day, they stay in the hotel to we're at Basin. Uh, they questioned me about the murders. They showed me pictures of people, if I knew these people. Uh, I didn't, I didn't. I didn't give any information as such. Uh, 
they let me go. And as I walked out of the police station, Jack Bowler's words was me. His words me. It's still in my head this day. I'm sorry, Brian. It had to be done. That was an officer's words to me. So that tells me straight away police were involved. So even you decided to become an informant, what was the, what did you do? Right. So <laughs> the informant part, I, I didn't shop on them uh, before. I shopped on them twice over guns. So they wanted a machine gun. For what reason, I don't know. So I was in Strange Wave Prison some years ago, and I met a bloke called Delroy, Delroy Showers. I think he's a, he was a scouse, a well-known drug dealer, very, very well-known in Liverpool. I've made friends of him. For that. I went to see him a few times in prison. It's on record. Uh, he said, I could get anything for me. I asked him to get this. He said, he put me in contact with someone. A couple of weeks later, someone gave me a phone call. We had to go to Manchester, to the Piccadilly Hotel, bar underneath, meet someone there. Me and Craig sat there. Uh, about an hour later, this uh, black lad walked in. Uh, we had to go, we had to follow him, went down to, uh, I think it's Canal Street in Manchester for a drink there. So he wasn't taking us direct to the place, he was seeing if we was being followed. So we went down to Canal Street, then we went to Chinatown for a drink, and then we had to follow him. So we followed him up to Moss Sideway. Uh, he went into an house with Craig. Next minute, 20 minutes later, some money was passed, the bag come out, and Craig had a machine gun in the bag. We drove back to Basildon. I was a bit concerned that the machine gun was going to do a lot of damage, so I phoned Essex Drug Squad and uh, told them. Well, I phoned Jack Bowler first and told him that we had actually brought a machine gun back into Basildon. Uh, he said, OK, I'll pass it on. Gary Duck will phone me and said, uh, any idea what the machine gun is? And I said, as far as I know, Craig's got it on him. OK, that was it. Nothing done. So as we're going into 95, uh, Craig was getting a bit more paranoid and that lot and advised me that I left, I left Basildon before anything come on top. People still think I was talking. So he did. He paid me for go to Tanner Reef, give me some pills, went to Tanner Reef. I lasted two weeks. I come back, phone Mark, and Mark said, I'll get you a job in Barring Furnace. So I come back February 95, went to Barring Furnace, got there for a bit, uh, worked up there. Then come back to Bazin again uh, until May. Then things were getting really heavy again, and I left again, went back to Barring Furnace. And then Craig phoned me, I think it was December the 4th? No, December the 2nd or 3rd, phoned me and said, can you come back to Bazin? I want to talk to you. We're going to sort things out, uh, get it all sorted. You come back to Bazin, just forget about it. I was excited. I drove back to Basildon to my mum's bungalow. She was there, welcomed me in, sat me in a chair and a table. She said, we're going to sort this once for all. I'm not getting any younger. I want my sons back. That was her words to me. I thought, what's going on here? What's is something? She not well or something? So I sat there. Half hour later, Craig turned up. Uh, come in, shook me hand, give me a cuddle. He said, uh, I know you're not the police informer. He said, uh, for mum's sake, we're just going to call it a day now. Come out to Basildon. We won't bother you. Keep out of our way. And we'll keep out your way. And we about a couple of hours we're talking through. And he kept, he was on something because he kept walking up to the window looking at his vehicle outside. He kept looking and that. And I was over the moon. I thought, <laughs> I'm in with mother again. I'm in with Craig again. Things are going to go back to where I want them. I'm, it's working. So it's, it's getting late. It must have been about half 11, 12. Craig said, I'm going now. I've got a busy day tomorrow. So I said, I'll walk out with you. So his car's next to mine. He's got on his uh, Range Rover and the driver's side. I've opened the passenger door. I said, thanks for that, mate. Shit, shit, I'm grateful for this. He opened the glove compartment. He put a gun to me safe. He said, I fucking hate your guts, you cunt. If you want for mother, I'll put a bullet in your head. And I thought, what's going on here? You just, is it? So... I just shut the door. I see some coke in the bag. I shut the door. He drove off. I followed him out. As I'm driving down, because Beam is a long road before we get the main road driving down. He's drove down. A white Sierra's drove behind him. Me not thinking enough of it. He's gone. I drove the end of the road, got the phone box, and I phoned him. I grasped him up about carrying a gun and coke. 
nothing was done. I went back to Barry and Furness, and on on the uh, a couple of days later, mother phoned me. Your brother's dead. See the he ain't dead. I've seen the news. Yes, he's dead. So that's the last time I see him. You've reported to the coppers that he's had a machine gun. Nothing's yep. happened. You've reported he's had a handgun. How much coke? I think there were three kilo in a a, a black. I think it's a black bag, head head bag or something, some sort of sports bag. Yeah, I phoned, yeah. And it's on record. And I'm telling it live now. I grasped him. No one's ever known this. Just you, you and Liam, that's, that's it. All the years you weren't a grass, he was accusing you. You then become a grass. And then he says he knows you're not a grass. It's because well, he stuck the gun in my head. It's hard to understand. You think, you say, well, if you grasped him once, you grasped him twice. When you start playing with guns... You'd be in serious business then. You get me? Because Craig done an armed robbery once many years ago with a couple of his mates on a, a co op post office. Uh, not post office, a co op funeral parlour. Told there was 30k in it, but then he walked away with 3k. So I know came, uh, Craig was capable of using a gun. So when the machine gun wanted and coming to part, I was concerned, yeah. And I did grass him. It comes at a stage where everyone's calling me a grass, why not be a grass? How was that feeling for you? Good. Did you not care anymore? You didn't care anyway, but did you? No, I I, I didn't care. When I grasped him out about the, the gun and coke, I thought I was saving him, to be honest with you. Deep down, I thought, yeah, you go to prison for a long time. You might learn a few things. But it didn't work that way, did it? I... Yeah, it's, like, this is where it becomes messy. If you've got a machine gun, that's the coppers should have been on that. And I understand, like we spoke earlier, the coppers do let things fly to go to the bigger picture and create the bigger uh, story to then get more more names to the charge sheet. So letting people fly under the radar, okay, listen, I drive an offence, not asked about that. I'm not going to pull someone into the station and fuck up the surveillance for a shite you drive an offence and possibly maybe get six months. Uh, was it Tony who beat up the pizza manager? Pat Tight. Uh, Pat, who beat up the pizza manager, they kind of let that slide. Could it have been so much surveillance on them they wanted them for bigger charges? Or did they, the coppers know they were getting set up to then be killed, so just let them slide? It's hard, but then would you let someone walk around, you know the nutter, on, on, on gear with machine gun? It didn't make sense to me. Because I think he would have used it. Did they have something planned they were going to use it for? I don't know. But when he put the gun to me face after being the most lovable brother in that out, that bungalow and then put that gun to me face, I thought for years you've been calling me a grass and I haven't been. I'm going to state this now. I haven't been. I grassed twice up on the gun. I care what people think of me. Put yourself in my shoes. But when I grassed that day and I made that phone call, I had a big smile on my face because I thought you could drive down there, get nicked and he's going away for a long time. I thought you are... Mother, a destroyer. Because he'd have got 20, 30 years. You know how, what I mean? Firearm and drugs that much. How dangerous was Craig? Dangerous. I went to a a, a, a rave once with him at uh, some some f barn. It was me and a, in Rayleigh, me and a couple of friends. He went in there with his runners and I was outside having a smoke, having a right giggle and laugh and these lads come out. And they kept looking at us, and I thought we were going to get trouble here. And this lad came out and said, uh, I won't bother, that's uh, Craig's brother. And they were nice as pie. And I told Craig about it, what happened, and we walked out. He down where I walked outside, and he picked up a brick and smashed it against the lad's head. Didn't give a, give a certain, just fucking drove off. And then we went to a, a, a party once in Rayleigh again, and he, he, uh, he bottled someone there. And we left there and we got to uh, the roundabout and there was a a garage, Toyota garage. And he went up and smashed the window on the garage and I ran in and got the car for the Toyota just to laugh and joke. He drove the, the Toyota car because he didn't have ballards then to stop the cars going out. So he drove the, the Toyota. I went around to get the passenger side. He said, go and get another one. I said, no, nah, it's open the door. And he fucking drove and left me. So he didn't. He thought about himself and no one else. So the three of them have got together. The last time you've seen your brother alive was when he put a gun to your head and you phoned the coppers on yeah, him. Yeah. So the three of them have got together. Were they easily? Would they? Because it seemed as if, obviously, with the robberies, they'd have done kamikazes to do anything for money. They were very greedy. But would they have done anything? How did they then get down that lane? 
would it have took someone very close to them to get them down a the lane or were they so interested in money that if someone says they've got an earner come and meet us here they'd have done it there's there's loads of stories to why they went down the lane now i was told and it's a great source and and, and it, it, it will come out in, in a letter or from the person herself at the moment they're a bit quiet which i don't blame them uh that gilbert and mark randall Met him in the Fortune War. Gilbert met him in the Fortune War. Mark Randall took him there. Gilbert took him down the lane and the person waiting there to, sh to shoot him away. After a period of time, Mark uh, committed suicide and they say Gilbert was buried under the O2 Stadium. I don't know. But there's so many theories. But I believe that theory. I believe Gilbert took him down the lane and I believe that her dad was there waiting for him. But I could be wrong. I'm, I'm only saying what people are telling me that was around in those days, which the police, certain police officers would love to speak to them and get the information, but they won't speak to the police and I'm not giving the information to the police from him. Whoever's done it's been a stone-cold killer. Who, oh, it's... Whoever's done that, that's a proper, proper job to be standing there, free known madmen and blasting, was it eight rounds? I think it was, yeah. One gun. See, see but how, uh, the thing about a shotgun, how, there's two shells. You know what I'm saying? So somebody's shot them, reloaded. Was that a shotgun they were killed with, yeah? Well, they, they say the gun they use carries eight shells. What is that? Pump happen. So they, pump action? Yeah. So, so it's hard to... So Craig got it first in the air because he's on the driver's side. Yeah, and his feet was stuck on the, br the brakes yeah. though. Yeah. And then I had a fault. Pat that got it. Second, because it's next to you. Tony went to make a run for it. That's why he had mud on his boots. He's been shot in the head. The bloke's lifting him back in the car. Now, how did Pat Tony get mud on his boots? So Tony must have made a run for it when Craig was shot. So he put that one foot out of the vehicle in the mud. Bosh. The bloke's lifted up, put his foot back in the vehicle, shut the door. Why put the foot back in the vehicle? I don't know. Why was the mud on his, 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 his boot? Yeah, I never knew that. See, then they turn around. Yeah, that's that's it. And then they turn around and say, like, at the forensics, there was just a trainer print. No other prints. No Wellington prints that Mickey and that's supposed to be worn. No it, no forensic for overall. So what this, what the, the theory is from Bernard, who, who, who started this. Now I met Bernard in 96. And when I come out uh, last year, he wanted to be my best friend and do my book for me. and wanted to be on his side. But I'm not going to play Bernard's game. Bernard's made a lot of money out of it. Bernard's never been a partner. Let me get this out. He's never been a partner. He was a doorman, yes. A very arrogant doorman. A very rough doorman, yes. And he knows that. I'm not putting him down. But he was a doorman, never a partner. So he's come out and done all these stories, made these books. Good luck to him. Same as Colin. I don't care. All I want is the truth. That's why I've always turned around, sit at the table. We'll have a discussion, get the truth. Truth's going to come out. One of us knows something that someone don't know. But Berner's idea was that uh, he fought for years to get Mickey and that off, and then suddenly he's changed his mind and said they're guilty. So Jack was laying in a ditch down the, down the lane in his overalls. Mickey got in the Range Rover in his overalls. So you got Pat, Tone and Craig. What are you wearing overalls for, Mickey and Willie and Boots? I don't understand. You don't fight pains in oh no, but That don't make sense, does it? So they go down the lane and then Jack gets out of a ditch that they don't see with headlights on. It's only an 18-inch ditch and it's a big, huge bloke and there's no welly prints. So we've destroyed this case with our theories and our ideas and our lies to make money out of things. We've destroyed it. So I've come in here to tell the truth. How my brother was, what I think, what people are telling me. Was there not a Reebok trainer found? Was a copper not de a detective not see a Reebok trainer? Is that that's correct? It. That's the only evidence was found that floor trainer. No Wellington boots, nothing. I think it was a size eight trainer. And what about Jasper? I don't know Jasper. But then why would he make a statement saying what's happened? If he's made this true statement, which is on record apparently, why wasn't it come out before? He says it was a getaway driver, is that correct? <laughs> Well, he's took them down the lane. He's took them miles away from the lane. So it's, it's like Nipper in it. I've got a lot of respect for Nipper. I think he's a lovely bloke. Yeah, I like Nipper. And what he went through, you know, I 
If I had the balls, I'd probably do the same thing as him, but I haven't got the... But his dad told me did it. And I think he, I think his dad feels that bit of guilt because he felt like he let Nipper down, so he's come out with that. And I respect Nipper at all, but his dad didn't do it. I think her dad did it. Because they terrorised Nipper. They threatened his sisters and his family. And and, and that, does Nipper not shoot Pat? How true is that? That is true. He went to his, uh, Pat Blungle and shot it. All because Nipper was supposed to turn around and said something about one of the girlfriends. You know I mean, that, that's how paranoid the war. If so, if someone said a remark about your girlfriend, you say, oh, wait, slow down a bit, mate, slow down. You don't go and threaten to cut the sister's fingers off and that long beat them up. So, no, I don't blame for what he did. Because Nipper tried to kill him, apparently, and they, they seen him at the window or something. He shot him once, and I think the second time the, the gun jammed. jammed. And then when he see Tony and Craig come round his house looking for him, I think the sawn off. Something wrong with that. The uh, gun jammed as well. What about Darren Nichols? He was the one who gave evidence. I don't know, I gave, I don't know Darren uh, Nichols. Steel and yeah. Holmes. I think Darren Nichols is got in a situation where he got caught bang to rights with the gear. Instead of taking the blame and taking a lot of years going to get, he had a uh, couple of friend police officers that we're doing deals with that were there that time taking some of the drugs. They were suspended for three years, I think, and no charges brought against them. Why not? And so Darren's thought, well, I'll have an easy life here, get out of it, new ID. But he's got he's got the works and he no one knows if he's in this country or abroad. I think he's lied to his teeth. So Jack Combs and Max Steele, they were convicted. Do you think they're innocent? They're innocent, yeah. Yeah. Sad that isn't it? What age? Because it was Jack or Mick, one in the 60s, one's in the 80s now, is that correct? I think Mickey is in Wakefield. Uh, I think he's apparently got dementia. He's Why is turned, he still in? Because he won't admit to it. Did Jack admit to it to get out? Apparently Jack did, but if you go to the court case, Mickey didn't shoot him, it was only Jack that shot him. So, he, you know what I mean? Why would Mickey want to... Why would Mickey get three life sentences if he, they're saying Jack shot him and not Mick, Mickey? So I don't know. It, there's there's so many there's so many stories, there's so many theories that people keep putting out into people's heads. Uh, but at the end of the day, there's, there's only one army, one gang that you're never going to beat, and that's the police. Yeah, the coppers run the show. Yeah. There's no point yeah. in beating around the bush. That. And I think this goes higher up to when the young lass died and it's all in the papers. I think this goes to the top, goes to Parliament. You know, it goes right to the top. Mm -hmm. Let's nail this now. Yeah, because they are a proper threat. Once, because when in the criminal underworld, no matter if you've got grievances with these people, they've been bringing so much heat to Essex with the violence and the crime and the guns. The coppers don't want the guns in the streets and they obviously know what they want. So it could have been a whole game by many people who's got them killed. This isn't just one. There seems to be a few behind that and everybody's just kept hush because them off the streets is a good thing for society, for people, course, yeah, for yeah. the criminal underworld as well because they're making their money. They don't want that heat. They were those cannons. They become a threat, not just to themselves, but to everybody. But it's like anything. I mean... If some record, one of the brothers to a police officer says, I will take him out for you, that's, that's on record. Then you've got George Florence that goes around and gets the machine gun from my mum's house without any firearms officer. You don't do that, do you? Yeah, firearms officer gets the machine gun, has an affair with Donna. He's on charges of corruption and uh, over a car and this lot, but he's still in charge of the case. It stinks to high heaven. And I keep screaming out, corrupt police. Gary Duckrell won't talk to me. Who's that? The main drug squad officer. Now, if I was lying, he'd have pulled me in and said, Brian, look, stop spreading these lies. We'll have you in court. What was his name? What was the guy's name? McKelvey. Oh, McKelvey. He's the one, he's the one fighting for... Yeah, David McKelvey. Yeah. David McKelvey, who's he? He's, uh, he's, he's, he started his own uh, private firm mm -hmm. of security on shops, police officers and that. He's the one that's fighting for the release and... Uh, the convictions dropped with all the evidence he's apparently got and he keeps calling the noisy one but I mean they're doing a lovely job but if you if you like you come on here and you say something they're straight on the phone to you well give me this who's this person give me their address I'll get I mean people don't come out and speak, speak to anyone Are you with me they've got their own issues they want to speak they come out and speak I can't make people speak people are just telling me things about the last few few nights of what happened and the, the months in, in uh, 90, 95, which I don't know about. 
So people are telling me things. And one of the main people who's talking to me a lot is someone that everyone would love to talk to, but he's kept quiet for years and years, and he, he talks to me. And that's the way I want it, between me and him. I don't want to start blabbing his name off. And people think, oh, let me speak to him. Because Carlton says they were down that lane because that's where they used to get drugs, the gear dropped off. No, there's no proof of that. They had some gear dropped off once in the Blundell's farm in the lakes, and if going in the lake, they've never had gear dropped off down there. What was it like, the feeling, when you got the phone call that your brother was dead? I got the phone call from my mum. Uh, I was at work at the time at uh, Barring Furnace Oil Refinery. I didn't believe it at first, and then it sunk in. And I was emotional, I was upset, I, was, I couldn't believe it, how it happened, when the fact is that I phoned the police a couple of days before, and he could have been put in prison, he could have nabbed all three in together with the guns, yet let him die. I didn't understand it. And I went to work, and some lads at work were taking the mickey every day, and they deserved what they got, and all this crap, and they kept building up and building up, and I said, I thought, fuck you, I've got a Stanley knife. I cut my wrist through time and sprayed all over their food while I was sitting in the canteen and I was sexy for 28 days. <laughs> Did you lose the plot? I lost the plot, yeah. <laughs> but that's under, I'm laughing because it's mad, but it's, uh, it's understandable as well. Everything you've went through as a kid, the constant battle, trying to feel loved, not feeling loved, hating your family, but still want to build a relationship. Like it is, it is madness in the mind of what you went through. And it's understandable why you got sectioned. That's probably been the head of it, the release of it, because you used to set out to destroy your brother, your brother was destroyed, you probably have a bit of guilt, but you didn't as well, because they put a gun to your head, they fucking injected you, probably tried to kill you, your mum abandoned you, like it's madness. It is, but over the years, when I met my beautiful wife, Deborah, we got married, we worked all the hours under the sun, we didn't ask no one for a penny for our wedding, we had the best, we had a church, lovely meal, everything. They've even had two wedding dresses, didn't like the first one. So that was money. Yeah, but we we brought the family down. We thought, no, we're going to start again here, bring all the family down. We paid for all their suits, their outfits. We put accommodation up, everything. We put mum in, in with Debbie only had a flat, and we put our mum, my mum up, and Paul. We thought, no, we call it a day. We've lost a brother. I'll, I'll, I'll let it all go now. We'll start again. And they come to the wedding. We had a lovely day. We got a taxi back. From the wedding to the flat, we're unloading the parcels in the flat. Debbie's gone up, Tracy's gone up, lovely. Paul's gone up, Mum's gone up. Paid the taxi driver, gone. Next minute, taxi driver's knocking on the door. Hello, mate, you have us up? You ain't picked my 200 fags up, have you? At the back of the boot. No, mate, no. But then they spoke to Debbie, and spoke to Debbie and Tracy, and they got a bit upset. We didn't take no fags. You with me? And that was it. Next day, Paul's there smoking the fags, laughing his off. On our wedding day, he nicks the bloke's fags. You really don't do that, do you? So they haven't changed. They're still the biggest fucking arseholes going. And I won't be going to their funeral. Probably dump on their grave, but I won't be going to their funeral. When did you open up to your missus about it all? When I first met her. I didn't tell her everything. Fair play for accepting that. A lot of people would have fucking run for the house. Well, I told her uh, partially about my life and that. And she, she knew a police officer. They were friends for years at school and that. And he come around and warned her <laughs> about me. But she did turn around and say, he's already told me. Yeah, so I've told Deb the truth all the time. Is that the first time you've ever felt love? Well, I wouldn't change it. She's, she's a, everything to me. I mean, she's given me everything I want in life. Love, comfort, friendship, a son, a daughter, everything I ever wanted. Oh, I'd, 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 I'd kill for her. I'm not a violent person. Is that the first time you've ever felt that in your life? Is that everything yeah, you've ever yeah, wanted? Yeah. I had a bit of love and affection from Mark and Jackie, but nothing like Debbie gives me. You know what I mean? She's there. If I'm down, she's down. If I'm happy, she's happy. If I've done wrong, she gives me an earful. She's my rock. And I wouldn't change her for the world. What was it like becoming a father? Especially with all that doubt in your mind for all those years building up. Unbelievable, I broke down in tears. I even cut the cord, didn't I? <laughs> yeah. Remember that day. But it's frightening because what I went through, I didn't want to be a George Frederick Rigger. You with me? 
Sounds a bit bad, really, doesn't it? But you have things in your head. And you think to yourself, well, that's been done to me. Does it make me one of them? But no, my, my son and daughter are fantastic. She, she's in a top job. My son works with me. My grandchildren are, are, are doing well. Ones that was under the university. We have everything. We're not rich. We don't have a posh big house. We bought an old cancer house, but we're happy. You know, I go to work every day. Debbie's having a bit of problem with her arthritis in her hand. She's worked all her life as a hairdresser. But at the minute, she looks after our granddaughter and she looks after the house. Yeah. We have our holidays. So you think in life you're kind of moving through for it all and kind of everything you went through and then movies and then books, does that bring it all back to the surface, especially being quiet through those times? I feel better now I've spoken about it. I know I still get upset because it's still in the back of your head. You, you, you're still there thinking, so why me? What did I do wrong to deserve all that? But no, I, I feel better for it. I, I feel I feel like it's lifted a lot of weight on my shoulders. I do still put a lot of pressure on Debbie. You hear me? I, you know, I, I rely on her a lot. Uh, I do annoy her. But I'm enjoying speaking. It's fair to Because I've never spoke all my life. Now I'm enjoying... Am I in control? Uh, to a certain extent, I am in videos, isn't I? So I'm in control now. No one's telling me what to do. You get the odd remarks. But no one's telling me to do this, do that. I'm doing my own thing. How was it, though, staying quiet when the movies came out about the Essex boys and the books and everybody was writing books? How was that when you were in the it, shadows? Did that bring back a lot of emotion? It did and didn't, but I had to think of my wife. Debbie didn't want me involved in it, and I didn't want to get involved, and I let him get on with it, because I know a lot of it is total lies and fiction. You with me? A lot of it is. They made me brother out to be the biggest idiot going, and i tell you something, it's probably harder than Tony in his own little way, and how nuttery he was. So it didn't... It's only over the last, I think, I put a photo on Facebook saying this is my brother. And people couldn't believe it up there. Then some people denied it. And then, and then I got taught and it just built from there. Mm -hmm. And then Bernard got in contact with me and said to me, well, I'll do your book for you, no charge and all this. And we'll get you this done. We'll do this for you. And my words were to him straight away. I said, Bernard, why have you lied saying, I got it on the phone. Why have you lied saying he'd been a partner? And he sent a message back saying, I've never said I've been a partner. You know what I mean? So, yeah. But you can't, people are making money from it. Same as uh, Terry Stone. He's an actor. I think he plays the great part of uh, Tony with the hair and the madness. And then uh, the first film I thought, Rise of the Foot Soldier, was a great movie. Whether fiction, true, I don't, I don't know. But I just enjoyed it. I like those sort of films, Lair like Cake and all the madness. But it must be difficult when you've actually lived it. You, that was actually your brother. So it must be di more difficult from the outsider's perspective. Same as Bernie. I spoke to him a few years ago back in the day. I had a couple of guests on it I didn't like, which is understandable. Um, but everybody's just trying to make money, write books. Like I say, Terry's an actor, Bernie... But I lived that life. I don't know. Some people say he did. Some say he didn't. I don't know. Him and Carlton don't like each other. I think they'll fight, fight and argue. People are older as well. People need to get over it as well because it ain't a flex going through that life or who you know or who knew this or who had this information. This is people's real fucking life. Do you know what I'm saying? I think people need to get over it and understand this is people's real life. People have been through so much pain and misery. It's not a game. It's okay making money and doing your thing. By all means, do it. But... People need to give it a rest because people are getting older and people just want the truth. That's why it's good to sit and talk and people putting their perception on it and then people online, he's a liar, this is a snap. People need to stop that shit. It's okay, listen, people elaborate and fabricate stories because it sounds good, it sells books, it sells movies, but you've lived it firsthand. You were in the mix. You were fucking there and the shit that you went through at the start. It's, it's absolute madness what you went through. How do you feel when you go over it? When you speak about it, do you feel better? I do, yeah. When 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 you talk about quite a bit of it, like my brother and what I went through at school, it opens a part of you and it's very emotional. I don't think I'll ever get rid of that. I think it'll always stay there because it's just what you went through. But yeah, every time I speak, now I've never done a podcast. I've done one with Liam and, and you. I know done one on the phone with Sean Atwood, but... It releases a lot of pain, a lot of anger when I speak to you because I, I'm putting it out there. 
and it, this is going to go to a lot of people gonna, and they're either going to hate me or love me. I'm not worried about that. But it makes me feel better because I've released it. I've told the truth. I'm not here to, to lie and, and, and con people. But I'm not out to make, well, my making out a book. I put, went to work hard and paid for it herself. You know what I mean? No, no one's financed me in life. I don't want no financing. I just want the truth. I want all. I'd like if we all sat around a table and, and was adults, no argue, no falling out, and discussed it properly, and realised the people were hurting with our stories. I mean, what about Gray's daughter Georgie? What about Tony's disabled son? You with me? What about Pat's son? And we're going to start thinking about those sort of people with, with all the lies we're putting out there. Do you think there will, will be closure with it? Do you think there will be answers? No. This, 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 this. You'll never get to the truth of the killer. They don't want you to. The police don't want you to. We all know the police are corrupt. This, they're, they're corrupt these days. But back then, corruption was just a game to them. So can you see it coming out? I think this goes to the top. I think you've got MPs involved, whatever. I don't think you're never going to get the truth out of this. Mm -hmm. I think Mickey a die in prison. I don't think he'll get parole because he's the sort of person that won't stand by his license. You think, well, I've got dementia. I'm on parole license. I'm going to put a story out. What are going to do to me? Put me back in there for the next couple of years and I'll die. So I don't think they'll let him out. I think they'll silence him inside and it's wrong. Yeah, that's the sad reality. If other men have lost their life, but men are still losing their life over something they've never done. Yeah. Not There's people out there now that are part of this killing that nothing will ever happen to. Who would you like to sit down and talk with? I'd like to sit down with Colton, Bernard, Nipper, all of them. All of them. I'd like to sit down with all of them. Just just have no arguing, no effing and blind each other. Put a remark to them and give an opinion. You either accept it or don't accept it. No calling each other. I don't think Carlton would sit down with Bernard. I don't think Bernard would well, sit not down with Carlton. Would I you think... sit down with Carlton and Nipper? I would do, yeah, but I think Bernard, Bernard would have to have the last, I can see it happening now, I can see it in black and white, when Bernard's day comes and he passes away, there'll be that secret letter in his little filing cabinet that Vinnie would get out and say, look, my dad's confessed to the murders. Guarantee that's what's going to happen. <laughs> Guarantee you, he uh -huh. will confess to the murders. And he had nothing to do with them. What's the plans for the future? Look after my wife. And watch your YouTube channel because I know you're doing videos and that now on that for people to get involved and come across and watch your videos. Yeah, it's, it's doing quite well. I've got nearly 7,000 subscribers at the minute. What is your YouTube for people to oh, subscribe? It's on my phone. Must be. Yeah, so your YouTube channel is just Brian Richardson 1634. So every, I'll leave the link in the description. So go over, subscribe to Brian's page, and uh, yeah, get involved, help him out, man. Listen, if anybody's got any information as well, then by all means, like I say, it's 30 years, nearly 30 years, eh? And it's um, and it's still spoke about, and there's fresh information coming out. You just don't know who's watching. A deathbed confession, you don't know. But it's such a high-profile case, and I think the movies and the books have heightened it as well. Um, with all the movies, I think there's six or seven movies being done. And by all means, if people want to make money, then it's down to them. But it's just all the bickerness, because like you said, everybody's kids who still probably That's struggle with that. That's it, the ones that struggle, to get closure and eventually move on with their life. But listen, I'm happy to have a sit down with anybody who's wanting to have it and talk it out. Like I say, I like Cal and his friends of mine. I like Nipper. I've never met uh, Bernie, but I'm happy to have him on as well and everybody have a discussion. And uh, put it to bed because all the bickering is not helpful to anyone because everybody can get on with their life if just everybody has the information. Because everybody might be getting fed different information as well. Everybody wants to be the, the big man. That's but what it is. everybody know, did play a part in some ways like I say Bernie was the bouncer Carlton was friends with Tony you were Craig's brother like Nipper did shoot fucking part like the kid is mad it is but whether he's like to believe it or not he's are all connected in some weird way and uh, it'd be good for everybody to sit down and put I think it will I think it'll solve and a lot of issues if we all sat down together mm -hmm. I think one would slip up and tell a bit of a truth rather than lying and then you're going to catch on that and think well, yeah that's right then we build from there yeah, I think yeah. we need to, to sit down and, and, and discuss it. For anybody watching, Brian, it's maybe been in a life of struggle and I don't know how to get out. What advice would you have for them? Just tell the truth. Just walk away. Don't don't hide behind fear. Any any person that's that's out there, 
being abused uh, in a violent relationship, speak, speak out. Don't live the life I've led built up inside you because it destroys you. It does destroy you. Do you have any regrets, Brian? Yeah, I didn't meet my wife early enough. Do you think that would have stopped all the pain? <laughs> no. Uh, regrets. I wish he was still alive, yeah, in a certain way. I don't miss him. It sounds, I sound hypocrite, don't I? I don't miss him. I don't miss the beatings. I'd have soon of them all got sent to prison. Uh, than, than, than been executed the way they, they had. But it's like anything. You can only push life so far, then it jumps back at you. It must be weird, though, because you did create the monster in him as well that's what I mean and then you you don't want to grass on him you do want to grass on him you don't want him dead you want him dead you want him in prison like it's a constant contradiction and a constant battle here you're trying to do good but also you're doing bad so it's that's where the the clash comes in have you ever sp spoke to anyone or had therapy I, I did not for this of it no no I've never spoke to anyone my Lady, <laughs> you've gave her all the fucking shit. <laughs> yeah, it's true. She gets everything. You've gave her all the trauma. It's, it's hard. I don't want to be a contradiction person and think no one wants a member of your family dead, no matter how you've been for in life. I'd rather see him get 20, 30 years in prison for what, what he's done or get done for killing Kevin Widdick, same as Donna. Yeah. Uh, my mother, I don't give anything about her you know that what she, she's caused this from day one if it wasn't for wasn't for her having an affair have an affair get divorced move on putting it into his head let's kill brian make it like a robbery we can be together have a happy house all paid for have his market stalls all this lot if it weren't for her selfishness and greediness we'd have all still been about craig wouldn't have been doing when i wouldn't have probably been doing what i'd done is your mum still living? Yeah, worse luck. When was the last time you spoke to her? Four years ago. Three. Is that the longest you've went without speaking to her? Second time. I only spoke to her quite a while. First time. When uh boarding school. And when I come down to find her. Then I didn't speak to her for four years, three, four years. And then this time after... The steam of the cigarettes and the silly fret down the phone. I got a message from her saying, uh, What you're slagging your brother off? He fucking hated you. If you'd have spoke to me in the star, I could have told you a lot more stories than what you know. That message. How do you think you would handle it if you found out she was dead? I wouldn't take a notice. No. I wouldn't go to the funeral, and let's be honest. Where do you go forward for the future? Enjoy ourselves. Enjoy our lives. I'm not doing no more podcasts now. That's it. It's the final one. Everybody says that. No, I think it is. I, I think you can only tell so much, can't you? Yeah. And then you get to that stage where you start making up stories. And it's not worth making up stories to make you look good. To drag it out. But yeah. you, you tend to see that because the thing is, is the, t the attention people get, it's enjoyable. People love the comments. People love the attention. People stopping them in the street. So it's hard to then stop because I've had people on, I will never do one podcast before, you know, they've done 10, 15. It's, uh, but like I said, it's therapy sessions. It's not just a case of the dark stuff in your life and what you, it's to understand what you went through and what you overcome. As much as people love the gory stuff, it's still good for people to be honest and speak about the traumas of the past because it then helps others. So you're not just a case of speaking and it's a story of the Essex boys, it's a story of trauma, pain, abuse, how you overcome it. And it's understandable how your head has been fried. There's no, there's not just a case of working an average fucking job, trying to get through life. You went through a lot of dark fucking pain alone, crying every fucking night, looking for someone to turn to and nobody's there. You felt fucking alone. That's understandable. The method of thinking, why you done what you done, who you, the, you created, the person you become. You were just trying to get through the pain. Yeah. But I created a monster, didn't I? You did. And that monster got killed. Listen, if there's anyone out there that wants to talk about what they're going through and I can help, get in contact with me and I'll do my best. Well, it probably helped me as well by talking. You with me? My wife can only put with so much in life. Yeah. But no, I'm, I'm, I'm 
so grateful for you letting me come here and open up and, and speak to you. Yeah, listen, man, as dark as it is, I've still enjoyed it because it's a powerful conversation. This will do well, and hopefully it, it helps whatever it is you're battling and hopefully you can get the answers and get some closure to then flip the chapter and enjoy family life because that's what it all comes down to. No, no matter what you do in life, if you ain't get family, you ain't get nothing for me and, and that's what it's all about. All the shit that you've went through has probably made you a better husband, a better father. So you can only thank the, the madness sometimes. But Brian, would you like to finish up on anything else? No, I'd just like to say thank you to everybody that's uh, subscribed to me, listen to me, all the support I'm getting. And if there is any children out there or adults that are going through what I went through, don't be frightened to speak out. You don't know. Good on you, Brian. All the best for the future and God bless. And you. Thanks very much for living Cheers, on. mate. Cheers.